All right, I'd like to call to order the October 19th, 2021 work session of Methacton School District Board of Directors. Please rise for the pledge. The public is hereby advised of the audio and video recording of this meeting for the purposes of rebroadcasting. By way of attendance, we have all of our board members present. Recognition of guests and scheduled speakers, Dr. Zerbe. Thank you, Madam President. This evening, we have a number of guests and scheduled speakers, but first we have uh, uh, PFM uh, to talk to the board about the potential for construction borrowing uh, in the new year. Uh, Zach Willard, Zach. Okay, thank you. Appreciate you putting me up front. So um, are we gonna put it up on the screen? Okay, we'll put the handout up on the screen and I believe everybody has a hard copy in front of them. Okay, got it. So just to take a step back real quick, so Zach Williard from PFM, uh, we're here to talk about the upcoming uh, new money borrowing for the capital projects of the district. Just to remind everybody in the audience, you know, this has all been part of a multi-step plan going back a number of years. Uh, last year, we did some, some new money borrowing as well as a refinancing and restructuring. The goal of the plan was to be able to keep the district's debt at, you know, at or around $10 million or lower on your annual budgeted payment. So this is kind of the next phase of the borrowing plan that we're going to walk through tonight. We were here at a finance committee meeting a few times earlier this year. And then we'll show you a timeline in the back of the handout, which has the debt resolution and the actual action by the board to be on the agenda for next week's regularly scheduled board meeting. Okay, so tonight we don't need anything from you. It's just to refresh everybody's memory ahead of uh, the resolution next week. So on the first page, I'm going to tell you the same thing we've been telling you for the last 12 years. Interest rates remain at very, very low levels. So it is a good time to do a borrowing. Uh, if you need to be in the market. At the bottom of that page, you can see you know, the lowest point uh, in the last 40 years was back in August of 2020. We've since come off the lows, but still at very historically low levels. It's hard for me to get in the middle there, but when you look at the middle box, that goes back to the early 90s, and you can see we're at the, the lowest point. Okay, So interest rates remain very low. Some of this is what we just talked about. You know, we've we've been showing you numbers for about $13.5 million worth of new project funds. I think that's the minimum that you need in order to keep the project going through uh, quarter one, quarter two of next year. I think we also talked about at a number of the finance committee meetings, borrowing up to $18 million. That is what I think you need in order to complete the project. So the two ways you can do it, or you can either borrow 13 and a half now, and then we would come back later next year and borrow the remaining amount. <clears throat> or the thought was because rates are extremely low, you could borrow the full 18 million uh, at today's market. And then you probably won't need to come back in 2022 for another borrowing. Okay, so if that rings a bell for everybody. The box in the middle of the page, you know, part of our job is to monitor for refinancing opportunities. The district's had great success with that over the years. Um, right now, you still don't have any opportunities because you don't have any call dates. You have to be within 90 days of the call date. And so those are your next call dates. So in 2022, we will be talking about a future refinancing opportunity, probably in late summer, early fall of next year. So keep that on your radar screen. As long as rates remain low, you, know, you have a chance to uh, refinance the debt, keep the same term and save some money. Okay. So real quick review of this page. This is what we call your debt summary. So columns two through 13 are your various series of bonds that were for new projects and that have been refinanced over the years. And when you look at and you add up all the different columns, you get to column 14, which is what appears in your budget. So as we said, the goal was to keep the payments on this capital plan moving forward at or below a $10 million mark. Uh, we will continue to be below that. You know, when you follow column 14 down a few budget years, you can see there's a major drop off in your debt service. It goes from, you know, about nine down to eight. 
and then drops down to 5 million and 3 million and so on. And that was an important part of the capital plan is that we're going to phase in these borrowings that phase in this debt for the potential projects as your future or your existing debt pays off again in order to kind of stay below that current bogey of, of 10 million. Okay. Now these are your gross debt service payments up top. The bottom half of this page is what we call the local effort in that blue bar. What it is, is it's the same bond issues, but you do receive reimbursement on some of them. Okay, plan con, if everybody remembers when that, you, know, you used to be able to do that for all your projects. Now you can't do it for new projects, but you still get reimbursed on old bond issues that were eligible for plan con. So in column 28, you can see what your net number is after you receive the reimbursement from the state. Okay. Okay, so on to the borrowing. So in front of you next week will be a debt resolution for a maximum amount of $18 million. Again, we've been kind of assuming this 13 and a half because that is the minimum that you need to get through kind of the next step of the, the phase of the project. Um, but I, I believe there was some interest in borrowing up to 18 million. So I'll just need some direction from you uh, either tonight or sometime between now and when we issue the debt uh, in the next two weeks, Tim can give us that. <clears throat> and it's gonna be hard to get the perfect angle here. But when, so when you look at columns three, four and five, Okay, column three, that's your existing. Column four will be the estimated new debt. And then column five will be what your debt payments look like after we borrow the next series of bonds. Okay, so when all the dust settles. And you can see when you look at the column on the right, again, the bogey was to stay below the $10 million mark. Okay, so this is a continuation of the plan um, and everything is still working out well. So any questions on this, the dollar amount, the borrowing amount, Existing debt service. Any questions for Mr. Willard to my right? Uh, Mr. Neverett? Yes, sir. Good to see you, sir. Um, can you talk about the 13.5 versus the 18? I know when we talked about it in finance, there's some discussion about the benefits of doing it one way or the other. Certainly, you know, we were fortunate in the past when we borrowed a little bit early, we actually captured some good interest rates and actually captured the arbitrage, which was fortunate, but certainly not right. something we should plan for. Um, is there any reason other than we think interest rates are going to catapult up tomorrow for some reason that we would borrow the 18 today? Yeah, well, let's, we'll quick roll through that. You know, with all these decisions that you make over the years with, with borrowing, it's always pros and cons to every situation. So, you know, if you borrow the full amount today, you're going to be hitting the market, you know, at what I described as historically low rates. Now, I'm not here to tell you that rates are going up or going down in the future. That's pretty hard to predict. But we do know where rates are today, and they're at very low levels. Okay, so that would be a pro. You can borrow at you know what is right now a historically low level. Um, you know, you, you always want to pay attention to how quickly you're spending the money. Um, you know, a longer project or a project that you're not in the middle of, or one that you don't have bids back for, for example, it's not always the smartest to borrow all the money up front because the bid could come in differently. You might spend the money over 24 months instead of a few months, so it's going to be sitting there. You borrowed at all-time lows, but it's going to be invested right now at, at basically zero. So that would be a con. In your specific situation, though, the spend is fairly quickly, I believe. Right, Tim? I mean, you, you expect to expend the full $18 million between now and I want to say the end of summer next year. But most of it will be spent between now and I think early spring. So in this specific case, it's not as much of a downside by borrowing it all up, you know, kind of the rest of it now. When you do two separate borrowings, you're going to have additional issuance costs. So if you do one borrowing, you're going to have one set of costs. If you do two borrowings, you're going to have two sets. Now it's not a hundred percent difference. You probably pay around you know forty to fifty thousand in additional costs by having a second series because all the large costs are tied to the size of the borrowing. Okay, but there is a duplicate issuance cost by doing two steps instead of one. And um, I think those would be the main ones in this specific situation. Uh, as to why you'd want to maybe borrow now instead of uh, breaking it into two pieces. Is that helpful? Yeah, I think just as a point of clarification, when we talk about the balance of this, it's for projects that won't be completed until the summer 2023. Well, oh, right well, I now, misstated that then. Right now, in not using the capital reserve, we need $13 million to finish projects right now. So that's all but $500,000 of that roughly. 
So if you throw in the projects for the summer of 22, we're looking at another million dollars. So we will have to borrow some money somewhere next year if we do not take more than the 13 and a half now. Because we have uh, roughly, I guess roughly 1.1, 1.2 million dollars worth of projects for this coming summer, which would push us up to needing 14.3 million dollars roughly. Any other questions from members of the board here to my right? Not seeing any, how about to the left? Uh, Ms. Drummond? Hi, thank you um, for this information. So I just, um, what what are the rates right now? I'm just looking at this and I'm seeing that the, what's callable in the near future, the Series B 2017, Series 18, 2018, and Series A 2018, the total of those is about 23 million or so of Correct. the three of them. So, and they're at various interest rates. So I guess, is there an, are you able to anticipate, I mean, given that we can't really do this now, are you able to project any anticipated cost savings for us for what those might be? Yeah. So, so when you look at those bonds, now they were all issued, <clears throat> when you look in 2017, you can see there, at the time, in the early part of 20, you know, 2017, rates were at what was, at that time, a historic low again. Those bonds are issued at very low rates. I don't know the interest rate off the top of my head, but I'd say they're kind of in the mid-2%, which sounds low. In today's market, we can do better than that. You know, we can issue those. Those bonds are fairly short. The amortization is not long. So if you look, they go out to 2035, and then columns six and seven are even shorter. So we'd be issuing it certainly below that in today's market. Savings, you know, in the few hundred thousands to maybe, you know, half a million dollars, depending on where rates are, if we could do it today. Now, the first call date that you mentioned is the 315-2023s. So what that means is we'd be able to settle a transaction 90 days before that, which means we can lock in rates 120 days before. So that's why we'd want to talk about that, you know, kind of next summer so we can prepare for it. And then if rates remain low, we would be able to execute the refinancing, um, you know, around November, December timeframe of next year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on my left? Seeing none. Any other final questions? No other questions from members of the board. Thank you, Zach. We appreciate okay, your, your time this evening. Next week, John Cox from Eckerd Siemens will be here to answer any questions about the debt resolution. Excellent. All right. Thanks, everyone. Next on the agenda, we have the summer 2022 Eagleville roofing proposal of Fidavia. Mark is here from Fidavia uh, on that matter. And then also the second matter uh, for Fidavia this evening is the Arrowhead and Eagleville construction update. So we'll start with the Eagleville roofing pro proposal. And please know that his uh, conversation this evening about the Eagleville roofing proposal is tied to item 9E on your agenda which is the Eagleville Elementary Addition and Renovations. It says approved a change order, uh, GC003, which is a credit back to uh, the district of $45,428. Mark? Yes, um, so the credit is for just that. It's for a uh, metal fascia that is built into the Eagleville project currently. Um, moving forward to do that roofing project next summer, um, we wouldn't want to put new metal up now we just have to take it off and put it back on so take a credit for it now the proposal for Sobeck is to um, do an inspection of the roof put together all your bidding documentation specs and drawings to go out to bid um, it's a two-part proposal uh, the design part of it is a, a 25 294 for the design phase and a 4858 um for the infrared scanning of the roof and that's just to take a um a aerial photograph of the roof and with the infrared you can see what insulation is may have been compromised by water with leaks and will better help so back to put the the project specs together to quantify how much insulation would have to be replaced and then the construction phase for them is 49050 um, you could certainly wait to approve that portion of it until after we get bids for the project itself. Are there any questions uh, from Mark on the Sobek uh, roofing proposal 
and its relationship to 9E and anything going forward. Uh, Mr. Navarrete? Yeah, just on the, um, I think we, we understand the change order, but regarding uh, Mr. Sobeck's proposal, can you just talk about the relationship that he's had with us over the last couple of years and a lot of the roofing projects that we've done here in the district? My point is he's not new to us, right, in terms of his, his Correct. Work quality. Yeah, I believe every roofing project you've done in the past, like, five years has, has been run by Sobeck. So we, we've used him as, as members of the board know regularly. We've used Sobeck uh, uh, extensively for not only uh, uh, doing these, uh, putting these bid specifications together, but managing projects as, as well as doing the inspection of all of our roofs and managing the long-term uh, uh, scope of, uh, we call it a, a, a replacement uh, period. So for example, we, we label them A roofs, B roofs, C roofs in a, in a, in a lettering sequence so that we knew when to start, you know, repairing the roofs, and, and this is one of those times where it's it's reached that threshold, and uh, we're able to bring it before the board here this evening. So again, uh, this isn't approving the actual construction uh, of of the roof, but just putting the bid specifications together. And the second part of the motion really says, if if it is approved, um, they would use this same firm to do the construction of uh, oversight, uh, be our owner's rep for that particular project. Yeah, I, I don't have any issue with the uh, conditional approval next week either. Mark's done good work. He's helped us. He's found a lot of things that have helped us repair roofs where we didn't know we had issues. So thank you. Any other comments or questions uh, on the matter of the Sobeck uh, proposal? Uh, Ms. Perdue? I just, can you clarify again exactly what, so we have the 30 um, here for the cost, just for the scanning, right? Just the scanning was 4,858. Uh, to put together the documents to go out to bid was 25,294. Okay. And then what was the 49,000 again? That's just for the oversight? That's, yeah, when, that's okay. for the construction phase. And then we'll get the actual cost once the bidding is. Once the design docs are put together from the first okay. half of that, the 25 and the four, um, we'll get, yeah, we'll go out to bid and we'll get numbers from contractors to do the project. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Purdue. Any other comments or, or questions from members of the board? Seeing none, thank you. Well, let's move on to uh, the next item on the agenda, which is the Arrowhead and Eagleville construction updates. I think we have a presentation to share up on the screen. Yeah. So Arrowhead, the uh, building exterior, uh, we're continuing to get permanent enclosure with the vapor barrier going up and uh, all the bricks going up. Um, and we're continuing roofing throughout. I don't know if it's going to scroll down or just go to the next page. Okay. Um, inside the corridor, partitions, wall framing, and masonry still going on. Um, getting close to being finished with that on the first and second floor classroom wing. Installing hollow metal door frames throughout. Continuing interior CMU throughout. Uh, MEPs inside. Oh boy. Hey, Mark. For those of, for those out there that aren't familiar with it. Can you clarify what CMU means for people? Uh, masonry block. Thanks. It's just a normal concrete block that you see built in a lot of these buildings. Yeah, sorry. Um, inside, installing overhead, mechanical rough-ins are going in, in-wall rough-ins throughout first and second floor classrooms, um, and getting the MEP rough-ins under slab at the gym and the stage area. And we have looking forward into next month. Um, we'll continue with the TPO roofing, uh, continue construction interior CMU walls, continue slab on grade prep at the stage in the gym, uh, steel stud walls on the exterior walls, continue installation of roofing. I imagine we should be getting close to being done with the roof by the end of next month. 
continue brick on the exterior of the building, continue MEP layout rough-ins throughout the first and second floors, completing framing in the kitchen and cafeteria areas, install structural steer, steel at stair tower three, and complete slab on grade in the administrative area. Uh, financials are status quo, no change orders for Arrowhead. And we're still, still on schedule. Let's pause there for a second and see if there's any questions uh, for the Arrowhead project before we move on to Eagleville. Any uh, to my left here, just, Ms. Reese? Just a quick one, um, more out of curiosity. Um, I know it's kind of open now, I'm assuming, to get materials in. When is it somewhat more closed? I'm assuming relatively soon. Yes, relatively soon. Like, de <laughs> like December? Um, late November? Yeah, late November. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reese. Any other questions or comments from this side? How about to my right? No, no other questions. Let's move on to Eagleville then. Okay. Eagleville. Um, on the new addition, we're still we're installing face brick. Um, completing the spray foam insulation and completing storm water, uh, storm and sewer piping, uh, phase three windows and cast stone, installing aluminum windows throughout the addition, installing cast stone throughout the addition, and completed slab on grade at the new addition. The interior of the addition, installing drywall on uh, classrooms and corridor. Begin taping and finishing drywall throughout classrooms and corridor. Uh, complete overhead and wall rough-ins throughout the classrooms and corridor. Uh, interior of the addition, phase three, completed wood blocking, completed overhead uh, and in-wall MEP rough-ins, electrical, HAC, and starting to hang drywall. Uh, the month to come. Should have all the ductwork and piping for the air handler units completed. Uh, Rough-ins for AV fire alarm control wiring to the new addition. Installing sprinkler piping. Uh, complete all the new brick and, and cast stone. Complete all aluminum windows or a new addition. Continuing joint sealants at uh, the new brick control joints and windows and cast stone. And start looking at drop ceiling in the phase three areas and plan for temporary heat in classrooms, administration, and a few other learning spaces. Thank Anyone? you, Mark. Are there questions on uh, any of the legal matters? I hear to my left. Not seeing any on my right. Not seeing any. Uh, I know that we do or the or the board uh, a tour of Eagleville, uh, so we'll get that scheduled in the in the coming weeks. Uh, are there any final questions for for Davy on on the on basically the three matters? Seeing none, Mark. Thank you very much for your time this evening. We appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have Dr. Susan Angstad here to present the uh, an update on the Pays Student Survey. Dr. Angstad. Good evening, everyone. I wanted to share a brief update with you on the Pennsylvania Youth Survey, commonly referred to as PAYS. One second. So first I wanted to just share an overview of PAYS as it relates to the actual survey. The Pennsylvania Youth Survey is administered anonymously to students in grades six, eight, 10, and 12 so we can learn about their behaviors, attitudes, and knowledge concerning topics such as alcohol, tobacco, other drug use, violence, and mental health. And this year's survey will also include some um, questions related to COVID-19 and the pandemic. The PACE survey is provided at no charge to schools and districts through funding provided by the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, the Pennsylvania Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs, and the Pennsylvania Department of Education. 
It's important to note that PACE was founded in 1989 and has been um, an active survey for many, many years. It is conducted every other year in odd years so they can collect that cohort data and look at those trends over time. The PACE survey serves to gather data for local data and information um, that's needed to determine what prevention and intervention programs our county agencies will be looking at and ways to address these issues that are facing our youth in the community. Additionally, they also look for the input from our youth on protective factors, things that are supportive in their communities, their families, the relationships they have that are really helping to support them to succeed in life. And then I also just wanted to provide you with a little history of the PACE survey as it relates to Methacton School District. We have been participating in PACE since 2013 again, done every other year. The benefits to the district include county resources and services, such as our SAP liaison support through Carson Valley, various assemblies, and evidence-based interventions and programs for our schools. It's also important to note that the PACE survey results are often used in any of our safety and risk assessments that we're doing, and also to support any grant applications. We use that data um, to gather additional funding. I've included our two 2019 pay participation rates for your review. Um, you will see that we were at 81.7 in sixth grade, 8th grade, um, 97.6, 10th grade, 97.9, and 12th grade, it drops, and that's historic, historically been the trend. It's also important to note that participation in the PACE survey is completely voluntary. Parents have the right to review that survey in advance and choose whether or not their children can participate. It's also important to note that as students are taking the test, they are informed by the test proctors that if they don't feel comfortable answering any questions or they don't understand them, that they may skip them. And afterwards, if they have any concerns, they are advised to talk to their school counselor or any trusted adults. And that ends my presentation. Any questions? Any questions uh, from this side? Uh, Ms. Reese? Um, just a quick one. I have facilitated this as a former sixth grade teacher. My eighth and 10th graders will take the survey. Um, I have facilitated it at least twice. I don't teach sixth grade anymore. I only taught sixth grade for, I don't know, six years. But isn't this something that almost every single Montgomery County public school participates in? Yeah. Okay. Many of them do. And outside of Montgomery County as well, I assume. Yes. The okay. PACE survey, if you look at the data over the time, has been administered to over a million students in Pennsylvania since it started. Okay. Thank you. And it continues to grow. Participation continues to grow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Reese. Any other questions uh, on the PACE uh, from this side of the table? My left? Or no? Uh, my right? Um, Ms. Kankra? No, the only other thing I would add, too, is that it's not just public school. It's also private schools and parochial schools. So That's all correct. schools of Pennsylvania have been participating in this. And That's so correct. I just think, you know, overall, it's important for us to really understand, especially now, that we are going to receive a lot of support that these students need. We utilize this information for get the grants that you have filled out for us, which has been phenomenal. But this is something that has been run... Isn't it from like Penn State, this Penn State where it was and founded? Bob Harrison. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's something that it's been around. We've done it for the past eight years. And I know that a lot of people have found some conflict in the community because these questions definitely make you uncomfortable that your students are addressing it. So I think it's okay to know that you're able to opt out and you know you're you have that ability to do that. But um this information, when you give the survey, is it during core curriculum classes? No, they're using um, a period. It takes about 45 minutes to complete the survey. It's one day and it's done. Um, Skyview and Arcola are both using a period at the end of the day, and I'm not sure what period the high school is using. Yeah, and I think that's important, too, because I did hear parents were concerned that they're removing themselves from a core class, which I completely understand when it's a value of like 40 minutes to fill this out. So. Mm -hmm. 
you're absolutely not getting pulled out of your core classes. You have the ability to opt out. Private, parochial, and, and public schools are taking it. And it's we've been using it for the past eight years that we've received a lot of resources from. So I thank you for just presenting this because I think it's just important that people understand the survey. So thank you. Sure. Any final questions, um, Ms. Perdue? How are we communicating with parents about opting out if they choose not to have their children participate? So all the parents have received a letter from the building principals that not only provides them with information about the testing date, but it also provides them with the link to where they can see the survey in advance. And then if they still prefer to opt out, how that process works. And then a running list of anyone who has opted out is kept so that there's um, and that information is available on the day of the assessment. How much time are we giving them to opt out if they choose? The window's open for two weeks prior to administration. So I do have the testing dates if you're interested. Um, should we move forward with this tonight? Skyview was planning to do November 1st, Arcola November 3rd, and Mefacton High School on November 5th. Any other questions, Mr. Uh, Winters? Yeah, I just want to make the point. I think it's really important that we continue this. I support it as well, as we want to make data informed decisions on uh, what's the right thing to do for our students. I think it fits perfectly and dovetails into our charter. Thank you, Mr. Winters. Any final co comments or questions for uh, Dr. Engstad? Seeing none, Dr. Engstad, thank you so much. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have Dr. Zergini. Our, our Director of Human Resources, Dr. Sergini has a substitute update. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Zerby. Tonight, I'm providing the board a brief update on the status of substitute teachers in the district. I'm also asking for board action to address a proposed change to one of our rates of pay. While most districts across the Commonwealth are experiencing challenges with securing substitutes, one of the specific issues that we are facing is attracting properly certified subs for our longer term positions that go beyond three days. In Methacton School District, all of our teachers have three days of emergency lesson plans. So even when an absence is unexpected, there are lesson plans for our substitute teachers who come in. Beyond three days, the substitutes who come in are responsible for developing plans and providing that instruction to the students. Our contract with our, uh, next slide please. Thank you. Our contract with the substitute teacher service differentiates our rates of pay based both on the number of days that our substitutes work in the district as well as their certification status. So on the, the right side of the slide, you can see our current rates that differentiate, as I said, both for number of days of, of service in the district as well as their certification status. Substitute teachers who are here for a long-term situation, which is generally defined as 45 days or more, receive a significantly higher rate of $249.54 a day. That is uh, based upon the fact that those teachers come in and they absolutely have to do lesson planning, grading, and additional communication with parents and uh, other educational professionals. Next slide, please. So in an effort to attract more substitutes to our longer term positions, what I'm asking the board to consider is approving that additional higher rate of 249.54 to be provided to substitutes starting on day four of the time in the district, recognizing that there's an additional amount of work that has to be done and that pay would be commensurate with that additional work. It would also hopefully attract additional substitutes to those positions that we are currently experiencing some difficulty filling. In addition, I'd like to advise the board that moving forward in November, I've already been in contact with STS to talk about once again, moving forward with the guest teacher program. The guest teacher program is a program in Pennsylvania that allows individuals with a four-year degree that is not in education to receive a temporarily, temporary locally issued uh, permit to allow them to be guest teachers in school and to serve as our substitutes. And many of our building subs right now are our guest teachers and are doing an excellent job for us. So I'll be moving forward that, with that in November. But in the meantime, I'm also asking for the board to consider the higher rate for substitutes from four days on. 
I welcome any questions that you would have. Yeah, before we take questions, this is really a supply and demand uh, challenge here. And, and I think what Dr. Sergini is trying to do is say, um, you know, we've, we've done well up to this point, uh, but we're starting to, it's starting to get a, that much tighter and we need to put ourselves in the right competitive space to be as attractive as possible as we get into potentially even more challenges as, uh, you know, as the COVID matter, uh, you know, plays itself out over these winter months. So questions from members of the board. Ms. Reese? Um, first, I want to say I fully support this. Thank you for being proactive. And I have a question that's uh, sli slightly off but on topic. I was actually speaking to a substitute in my building today who's a Methacton grad, and he is a grad in, in business. Anyway, he's going for a new thing Pennsylvania is doing. I don't know if, and I'm sure you know about it, but I didn't know what that was called. It's not guest teacher like we're doing, but he's going to be, eight, he, I forget exactly all the details, but after 60 days, he's done some program. And then after 60 days of substituting or what, or that kind of thing, he's going to be able to teach math, even though he, do you know yeah. what that, I just, I, all I, I'm asking because I know right. Pennsylvania is even trying to be proactive because every district across the entire Commonwealth is struggling. That's correct. There are alternate paths to certification that after a certain period of time and also passing a praxis, they're able to secure the, uh, the certificate to teach in that particular area, even if they didn't major in education. So I, I'm looking ahead at the, uh, the strategic planning meeting on Thursday night, I'll be sharing some uh, statistics on number of certifications that have been issued in Pennsylvania over the last 10 years. And uh, it's dropped, we're at about a third of the number of certificates being issued in uh, tw uh, 2009, I'm sorry, 2010, 2011, 2020, 2021, as were issued in 2010, 2011. So it's a third across the state. So uh, Pennsylvania is being very proactive in looking to provide alternate paths to certification. Okay, that's a, that's a good. Okay, so and I should have told this uh, gentleman to remind his friends about the guest teacher program. So Absolutely. I will see him again this week, and I will make sure to do that because he was one of those people like myself who went into the corporate world and said, you know what, I should be a teacher, and we we need a lot of people like that in the next 10, 20 years. Yes, Thank indeed. you for this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reese. Uh, Ms. Drummond, I saw your hand. Thank you for this and for this approach to the substitute issue. Um, and I really appreciate the guest teacher program coming back. Um, I mean, it didn't go anywhere, but just to reintroduce the idea to, to our community. Um, I have a question about the rate of the 249.54. Is that my initial understanding of this proposal is that the, the person receiving that rate on day four they would sort of give us a guarantee that they're going to stay with us for the 45 days. Is that is that still the case with this proposal? And I guess how would that be enforced? It's not necessarily 45 days. These are positions that might last maybe 20 days or 30 days, for which in the past most districts have not had an issue with securing a substitute, even with the additional work that's involved. So what we're asking for is properly certified individuals to guarantee us that they would stay for the duration of the time that the position is available. And that may not be 45 days, but it may be some other amount beyond that. Thank you, Ms. Drummond. Uh, Ms. Perdue, I think you had your hand up. Um, in reference to the, uh, um, the rate increase, how do that, where do that put us in reference to other schools? That's a great question, actually. We met with the uh, vice president of the of, of STS last week to discuss that and discuss whether or not this would make us more competitive uh, as far as other districts in the area. And we were assured, without divulging any specific information, that we are competitive right now in our other rates that you see um, that I included in, on the second slide, but that increasing the rate for uh, the situations that extend beyond the three days and for which there's the additional work would make us very competitive. I guess I struggle a little bit about how we say or ensure proper, properly certified substitutes. So, and we're still going with STS, right? That's where we're getting our substitute pool from. That's correct. So how would that ensure that, and I know you went through 
the different certifications? Is that do do they fall in a different certification pool at that point? No, it, it, what I'm looking for is properly certified in the area for which there is an absence. So, for example, an English certified individual for an English opening or science for science. Okay, thanks. Yeah, if I could just add to that, I think I think what he's what he's talking about is everyone that we bring in through this is properly certified. That the challenge is uh, attracting those that are hard uh, certifications to find, regardless of the. Uh, a uh, climate uh, within within the within the the certifications, meaning you know your math sciences and stuff like that. So it, it's it's a combination of, of uh, a, co a conglomeration of the word. Absolutely, I apologize <laughs> if I gave the impression that we had no, improperly no, certified no, that's individuals. That's fine. It's just it, it there, there are certain there are certain like you know we, we need to get a chemistry and a and a physics. I mean, those aren't like those two certifications together are are nearly nearly impossible. Uh, and I, I, I don't need to say it that way, but it's, it's really hard. There, there are people out there, but it's not like, uh, in lack of a better term, there's more readily available, say, an elementary certification than there is a, a physics and science certification uh, that, that's available. So by, by putting us in this market space uh, will help us pull from the small pool that's in our geographical region. And that's what we're trying to do to provide the best opportunity, uh, given the circumstances that we had for our students. Uh, Ms. Drummond? So, so just to clarify, this 249.54 rate would be offered to then people who only the substitutes who are then certified in the area which there's an absence which they're filling in. So That's someone correct. doesn't have the that particular certification. We would still welcome them to come in for a shorter duration of time, but we're we're looking specifically for the correct area of certification tied to the opening that that exists. Okay. Or or if they were in if if it came down to that they were in a position for five days with mm -hmm. the district but weren't that didn't have that certification for that particular subject area. We're still they remaining. Get, as a, they wouldn't get this. That's correct. To okay. Thank you. Any other questions on my left? Seeing none. Hop to my right, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, McGinnis. Dr. Sergini, you mentioned that um, this puts us to be competitive. Do you have a, a sensitivity analysis of that? It Would a couple bucks more put us at the top of that? I'm assuming this labor market is highly elastic in that all things being equal, if I can get $2, $3, $4 more, I choose X over Y. Uh, I do. We are assured by STS based on their data and their knowledge of what other districts are offering that this makes us very competitive. So we're not going to lose somebody for $2? No. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Winters? Yeah, so I'm going to ask you a little different. Is I assume the main purpose here is, is because we can't find certified because we may not be competitive to North Penn, for example, that are at 190 i think it is or somewhere around there 185 something like that and so and we're trying to make sure that if we do have a teacher that's a uh, staff member is going to be out more than three days that we have somebody that can teach the subject and with the knowledge the deeper knowledge than just a regular sub is four days the right cut off should we be even lower should we be three days Three days we have appropriate substitute plans that are available from our Methacton teachers that can be implemented regardless of the circumstance. So, But once we hit four days, that's where we are in need of the, the new uh, substitute planning. So looking to, it, it's primarily situations that we find ourselves in, as every district does, where somebody is going out for a, a period of time sometimes for medical, sometimes for personal reasons, where they may be out six to eight weeks and that threshold of 45 doesn't get reached. So we're looking to fill that particular time slot, especially with somebody uh, to the earlier comments that it has the proper certification and can provide the best quality instruction. And I imagine if the, as they're working, uh, if they, they're getting that 249 for the four days, but they also substitute another 40, 40 some days, they will end up with the 249 permanently at that point. They will. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Winters. Uh, Ms. Cancro. My only other question, I guess, is I, I, this is fantastic. The guest teacher program that we're going to do for the temporary teaching permit, the rate, would that be 105 
at the rate. See, that's my only concern because if you're looking at somebody that's that's a scientist that wants to do it, that 105 is low. So to me, I would think that it, that, that rate should be at that 249 because they'll be able to be, they'll have the capability. The rate is somewhat lower uh, with the guest teacher program, but one of the things that we've been able to do is utilize our guest teachers as building substitutes. And when they commit to a longer term with us, we're not putting them into the circumstances that we're talking about now where we have a longer period and we're looking for somebody who's properly certified in a particular academic area, but they guarantee us that they're going to stay with us. And then they do get the higher rate that's commensurate with the duration of time that's served. Yeah, I just think like if making sure they get the appropriate rate and same thing with the retired teacher rate. When we have a teacher that's taught and they're not going to be happy, I wouldn't be happy to go there. I'd want the 249 and I'd be able to really be able to provide the lessons, gradings and communication. So we, absolutely. We are exceptionally fortunate that we have a, a significant number of our retired Methacton teachers who come back on a regular basis, even daily basis uh, throughout the year to assist us as substitutes. We're, so we're very fortunate that way. Yeah, I'm just saying like if we, if to get the teacher, if we have to use utilize the 249 because it's under that certain rate, we should optimize that Absolutely. negotiation. And, and uh, moving to our retired teachers is very often our first move because they're, they're individuals that we know, trust, and uh, have provided dedicated service. Oh, thank you. I, we, we need to do this. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Just a, just a quick follow up. So you're saying a retired teacher now is filling in for a chemistry for seven and and taught chemistry before, and they're going to teach four days. They're going to get two forty nine now instead of one thirty five. They would be in the same situation as anyone else who were able to bring in with okay. that proper certification. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cancro, Mr. Winters. Any other questions this afternoon, members of the board? Uh, Mr. Navarrete. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think most of my questions have been answered. Um, as far as building subs go, are we moving them then to the LTS rate? We move them not to the 249.54 rate, but to the higher rate, the, the 135 that's commensurate with the duration. Okay. I mean, it would seem like we're talking about LTSs. Let me back up a step. It's a dogfight out there right now to get substitute teachers, right? If we have people that are going to commit to our district for some period of time, whether they're committing to one position or they're committing to us for a year, it would seem that they're in, if they're certified, that puts us in a similar circumstance. So while I support this, I would look at what the cost might be to expand it further. If we have, if we have certified teachers at buildings as building subs, and I'm assuming that when we have building subs that are, say unneeded on a given day, we're shipping them off, you know, say from Woodland to Worcester or whatever to make sure we're using our talent the best way possible. Um, I don't see why we wouldn't go full bore. And if people are making a commitment to this district, let's make a commitment to them and let's keep them here, especially if they're quality. Um, the other question I had too was, what is along those same lines? And you don't have to tell me what the, the underlying numbers are, but what do we estimate the financial impact to be so we know? I don't have a specific number for you. It's something that I need to work with Mr. Bricker on and have further conversations about. Okay. Yeah, let's let's definitely get that number um, before next week. And I'd actually like to see it, you know, let's if, if we were to expand this a little bit further, what that would mean for us as well. Um, because, I mean, the difference of, you know, $50, $100 a day, and it mean, but if it means we have kids that are sitting in a classroom, that are actually being educated versus sitting in an auditorium for a period. We're trying to do, you know, teaching. Well, let's let's do it. Um, okay. Now my other questions were answered. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, or comments from members of the board? Um, Ms. Aubrey Larsenis. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback off of what Mr. Navarat was asking. So to to reiterate that, um, I would support. Um, increasing that rate for the building substitutes because we have we have seven buildings. How many building substitutes do we have? Some of the buildings have two, some have one. Several of them are currently filling some of the positions that we've talked about that are shorter, longer term positions. Okay. So, but point being that the number of building substitutes is not likely to be a tipping point in terms of the overall cost of, of increasing this rate. So I would be interested in supporting that as well 
um, and getting further numbers on that as part of the overall cost that um, that we'll hear from you next week. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, uh, Mr. Winters? Sorry, one more point. I, I, I've said this before, it, I think it's important for the community to know contractually based on uh, time away where you have five personal days in the NEA, that's equivalent to 11 man years that automatically require a substitute on a daily basis. So we need 11 additional subs on a daily basis. That's before sick time. So the to the point of building subs, uh, we almost have a need for 11 straight out of the box if everybody took their time at an even keel. So I think it's really important that people understand that um, it, obviously the MEA is deserving of their, their time off as well, but it, it does, uh, because of that five days versus some other districts that have uh, two, three, sometimes four, uh, it puts a little more stress on us in this particular case. Any other comments, Ms. Drummond? I guess just along with the um, financials for this proposal, I would be interested also in seeing maybe a long, longer term look because it, it doesn't look like the certification rate is going up any longer, uh, you know, anymore, uh, and it's going down. So I think we're going to be in this um, situation for quite a while, and I think this is going to be a long term budget issue that faces the district. So maybe if we could just take a look at that, what some anticipated. Absolutely. And, and, and to answer some of your questions, we are having those conversations with STS and we're also being judicious in how we approach the increase in, in certain areas to ensure that we also don't overinflate and create a bidding war throughout all of the districts because uh, STS does represent a, a number of districts in the area. We're aware of what is being paid and we're looking to be competitive and, and then some without inflating it to a, a significantly higher amount that we would have difficulty sustaining over a long period of time. I would just add to that real quick, Liz, and the, to the whole board. Um, I know from talking to substitutes, you know, of course, you know, rate matters. Um, but I wonder if any of the principals um, could have conversations with any of the substitutes that are currently working for us about what they like about working here, what makes them choose to work. And the reason I say that is because if you're registered with STS, you can have a job every day right now and they literally can choose, you know, and they will choose, you know, a certain district or a certain building that they prefer or a certain grade. So I would just be curious. I know how, busy every administrator is, but if they ever got a chance to, to ask and not, we don't need to be, we don't, this information doesn't need to be shared with us, but what makes it attractive? Like I know in my district, there's one building no one will go to, and it's not that building's fault. It's just, they constantly get moved in that building. Like if they sign up for X, they always get moved. So they no longer sign up for that building. It, it, um, so mm -hmm. just, something to consider because as Liz said, this problem is not going away and this is not just pandemic related to a degree. I know, I think, you know, but it's not going away. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, uh, Mr. Everett? Yeah, just to back up on, the, on the, we've talked about what's happening in terms of the entire county and rates and whatnot. How do other local districts, specifically those that, you know, border us or are closer to us as opposed to those that are further away, how do they define their long-term substitutes? We have the particular rates. Uh, I don't have those figures with me tonight, but we talked with STS about that. There is really only one outlier as far as the competitiveness that is contiguous to us. All of the others we are at currently at or would be above with with some of the adjustments yeah i'm sorry jason i wasn't clear I, I don't mean in terms of the rate but in yeah. terms of how you actually designate them to be a long-term substitute right now we're talking right. about assignments that are greater than four days how is how do other districts do we were 45 before that right are Correct. other districts at 30 20 10? i don't have that specific information but could obtain it yeah that would be good to know as well thank you so just quick i can speak to some of that ralph did the long-term sub capability in many districts are written into the CBAs, which creates a different situation than what we have. 
Our LTS rates are not in the CBA. They aren't part of the bargaining unit. We go through STS for that. Most districts do not. So you won't see this 249 rate with many of the districts that are around us. It create, creates a unique environment here at Methacton. Okay, thank you. Now you're making me think. Any other questions? Seeing none of the questions, Dr. Sujini, thank you so much. Thank uh, we you have all. a little bit of homework for next week, but uh, I think these are <laughs> some information that we can certainly put together. Thank well you. done. Next on the agenda is a student modified quarantine test to stay program. I'll be taking the podium in just a second. While Dr. Zerbe is getting to the podium, I just, I've been discreetly following our student athletes. We have two um, teams fighting away in playoffs right now. And kudos to the field hockey team who did lose in overtime, but it was a great game at 2-1. And the varsity boys are hanging in there. I think it's halftime, but I'm trying to, I'm focusing, but I also want to support our student athletes. So I just wanted to give a shout out. Woo woo. <laughs> I guess that's not a shout, that's a woo. Sorry about that. This evening, it gives me great pleasure to bring to the board a concept that we were talking about back in July and in August again, when we were talking about the uh, 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 our, our safety uh, plan for this coming school year. And it is the commonly referred to as a test to stay program, but better known by in the medical community as a student mod or as a modified quarantine program. So what is a modified uh, quarantine program? Uh, it, it provides an alternative option for families when a student is identified as a close contact within a school. Again, I'm going to repeat that because those are some key words that are, I think are important for everyone, the board, and, and our public to understand. It provides an alternative option for families when a student is identified as a close contact within a school. And it provides an opportunity to maintain the continuity of in-person attendance at school, as well as provide for greater assurance for the student and family at home. The current challenge for close contacts, and again, I'll, I'll try to explain what close contact is. Let's say, for example, there is a child identified uh, as having been tested positive for COVID or an adult being a, a identified as testing positive for COVID. The, uh, clo the, the process uh, that we follow inside uh, the schools led by our school nurses is to uh, identify uh, during those the period of time that the uh, the child or the, the child was who is uh, identified as being positive uh, was in close contact that is uh, in proximity of uh, less than three feet for 15 or 14 point five nine seconds longer than uh, uh, than normal uh, would have uh, would, would would be considered a close contact that those students then uh, under the rules uh, designated by the county uh, for vaccinated versus unvaccinated students would then apply. And I'll just explain that a little bit. But for vaccinated students that may, they, they if they're considered a close contact, they may continue attending in person so long as they do not exhibit symptoms. But for unvaccinated students, uh, those students must quarantine for up to 10 days based on the initial exposure, regardless of symptom status. So a little data for the board to consider and the public to really understand here is that the impact uh, up to, from, from the start of the school up to 10-14-2021, uh, uh, the, the buildings are listed and the uh, numbers to the right of those buildings are the cases uh, that were processed uh, uh, for, for anyone that was either a positive or a close contact. So I didn't break it down. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of data. We're keeping all those those records. But the 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 the, the point of my uh, my 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 sharing this information is that of the of the four elementary schools, knowing that most, if not all, of those children aren't eligible to be vaccinated. There's 213 cases that are likely in impacting their ability to continue being in person uh, for a period of time. I'm not saying they're out for 10 days. I'm not saying they're out for a, any particular uh, uh, period of time, but I want you to know that 
about 213 students up to this point or up to the point of 1014 uh, were impacted. Now, certainly uh, at Skyview or Cole and the high school, there, there are there are students as well that have been impacted uh, that have had to quarantine because uh, they are not vaccinated. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, what what we're talking about here this evening is really providing an option for parents. Again, an option. We're not. This is a required program, but it's an option that uh, parents of, of unvaccinated students, uh, regardless of uh, today's status or a future status when the vaccine becomes available for certain age groups, that a parent may choose uh, to go through this, uh, what's called a test to stay modified quarantine uh, process and, I'll, and, and likely be able to attend school more frequently uh, once being identified as a close contact. So let me explain a little bit further. So the options for, for a family uh, of unvaccinated uh, students. The first option is, of course, the option that everyone has as of this point in time, which is the standard quarantine process. Uh, there's no testing involved. Um, basically, uh, if, if you're a close contact, our nurse contacts the, uh, uh, the parents. Uh, the parents come and, and pick the, the, the child up. And the working with the county, we determine uh, the the initial uh, exposure date, and from there we count, you know, back two days, forward seven days. There's there's a whole you know method to all of this, but generally speaking, they then decide it's you know you have to quarantine for X number of days, or generally you can't come to in person schooling for those number of days. And certainly, then what the the district does, or the teacher does, and the school they, they produce the uh, the work that needs to be uh, provided for the child sends that home and or uh, you know, communicates with a child through Google Classroom. The second option is what we're talking about here this evening is the modified quarantine uh, process, which which requires uh, testing to be done on an every other day basis and with parent consent only. So I'll talk about the process. So a student has been identified as a close contact. The school nurse confirms vaccination and symptom status of all close contacts. Parents, guardians, and asymptomatic unvaccinated student close contacts. And I know that's a lot of words there, uh, but uh, you know, parents and guardians of asymptomatic unvaccinated student close contacts are called and offered the two options. If a parent chooses option one, the standard quarantine process, meaning no testing, the child is placed in the school's isolation room until parent arrives and the child will return to school following the county prescribed quarantine period. The student work will be sent home and or uh, uh, presented via Google Classroom. And in certain cases, we have had uh, tutors in the evening uh, based on the teacher, the counselor, the principals, uh, and the student's needs. So there's a lot of different avenues uh, pro to provide support uh, for students uh, through that quarantine process. If, 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 the, uh, if the parent uh, doesn't opt for option one, the parent can choose option two. Uh, which is the modified quarantine process and and it is the testing where the child is placed in the school's isolation room until such time the parent provides the consent in writing so we i moved forward i've contacted the uh, district solicitor they've provided me a draft of a uh, consent form uh, and certainly we can have that uh, for you uh, next week uh, but the, the 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 challenge in all of this right now is that i don't the county hasn't, number one, given us all the information because they're still working through this process, but they anticipate this being available in early November, meaning the program, and that they'll allow it to occur. Because in, in, in Montgomery County, because of the Department of Health that we have, uh, which, is, which we've been working very closely with all the school districts in the county, um, you know, they, they have the say in whether or not this is going to go forward, and they've they've committed to this, and other school districts uh, like ours this evening um, are considering, um, you know, participating in the option. So what would happen here is the the parent would choose option two. They would get the consent, and based on the needs and considerations of the child, a testing will be administered using the county child approved shallow nasal uh, swab, a Binax now. Uh, antigen uh, testing. 
It's the same one that uh, we use right now for the voluntary adult uh, antigen testing program uh, here in the district. Uh, the results will be provided to the parent. A negative result will allow the child to remain in school. A positive result will require the parent to pick up the child and seek additional testing and or quarantine based on the county's uh, prescribed uh, schedule. What would, would then be required is the testing of the child would occur every other day in school by the school nurse. for the period of time for which is which is prescribed so that means that in that in some instances the the testing could be up to as many as four times uh, based on a uh, on the schedule and, and a notification of close contacts so this is a quick non-invasive uh, shallow uh, swab sample collected uh, at at the school under supervision of the school nurse or a trained health provider. So for example, we do get uh, third party nurses that support us uh, on a regular basis with doing other, other uh, nursing services. So it may not be the school nurse, but it'll be a, a nurse and uh, other uh, support individuals. The tests are administered every other day. And like I said, it could be as many as four times uh, per uh, 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 close contact notification. But that keeps the child in school for 10 days. And as long as, long as the child's not exhibiting symptoms uh, and it continues to uh, uh, test negative, uh, they remain in the classroom. Uh, the student, and generally the student pulls the mask down over their nose. Uh, the nurse will work with them to use a, a Q-tip, uh, go a short distance up the nose and uh, a circle around for about 10 to 15 seconds and then do the same thing on the other side of the nose. The uh, other considerations that we've taken in, into account uh, that we you know certainly the, re the required parental consent and the consent can be withdrawn at any time. So as an example, uh, maybe the, uh, the parent says, yes, I want my child tested. We go ahead and do the testing and then they have second thoughts about, you know, that being the proper course of action for their child. Uh, they can easily call the school and say, no, no longer are we going to be testing. And then what we would do is we would work out the situation of where you know, how the child would then be uh, 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 quarantined as, as a matter of, of uh, opting out of option two of the modified quarantine. Uh, we also have to take into consideration any of our previous healthcare experiences with the child. Uh, we know that um, we're gonna need to be able to provide some examples and demonstrations to make sure that, that we get, you know, children to a comfort level of being able to do this. And you know, we also include other caring adults as, as part of the support for when testing needs to occur. These are all things that uh, you know we, we've considered and had conversations about uh, because we'll be testing students that you know, you know, we'll have no issue with you know having a, a, a test like this done. But we will certainly have some students with possible sensory uh, challenges that you know we'll, we'll have to take a different approach. And with that said, uh, we want to make it available uh, for any parent and any child uh, under the parent's direction uh, th that they feel is appropriate. So some of the things that we need to consider, certainly it's going to require some additional staffing and that certainly doesn't come easy. Um, but in working with our, our school nurses, we know of, of, a, of a few nurses that we think uh, in the community that might be able to help support and offload some of the other nursing work while our school nurses would be able to, to conduct some of these tests. Uh, in addition, we would need some other additional uh, layperson uh, to help with the documentation and, and working directly with that, that nurse to uh, conduct that. Uh, conduct the testing. And generally speaking, the, that nurse would go uh, from building to building on a regular schedule to conduct the testing. Um, they would then be called when when an outbreak, or uh, not an outbreak, but a, uh, a close contact uh, situation occurs, and, and we would modify our schedule to get uh, th that testing done you know, as soon as possible. Uh, the costs associated with uh, moving forward, all the testing materials are covered by the CHOP and the county. Uh, but staffing would uh, be covered uh, for us under the ESSERS grant. We're projecting about you know, $1,600 uh, per week as, 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 uh, as a cost for the nurse and the, uh, the layperson. Uh, for how long? Uh, I, I can't say that at this point in time. Uh, we, we've, we've gotten some indication uh, just recently from the Pennsylvania Department of Education that suggests the, uh, uh, 
vaccines might be, you know, read more or may be available sooner for uh, younger uh, students. Um, and we'll wait to see when that actually gets released and, and is, and is uh, forthcoming for the board and the community. With that said, our recommendation is uh, under other and the agenda is approved the Methacton school, school District participation in the Montgomery County Department of Public Health CHOP directed test to stay modified quarantine program beginning in November 2021. If approved, uh, we would inform the county regarding our participation. We would secure staffing. We would send communication to families informing, informing them of this option. And we would issue a parental permission forms at the time of close contact notification. So we, we don't know how many you know, children will, will be uh, 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 afforded this option or, or we even wanna choose this option at any point in the future. Um, so we would do it at the point of discovery uh, with with a close contact and uh, make make those calls and, and make that communication and provide those assurances uh, with the families uh, prior to uh, conducting and certainly conducting any testing. So with that said, uh, that ends my presentation on on this matter. I'll I'll take my seat and then I'll take questions from the board. Before we even get into questions, I just wanted to um, clarify a few things or um, I guess reiterate a few things as well. Um, this came to the pandemic team. So I did hear a lot about this through um, our nurse, Cheryl Pfeiffer, um, and, and her and um, the, the two nurses that are part of the pandemic team both support this program um, and, and feel that it is critical to keeping our kids in the classroom. Um, it, it's something that they feel is manageable for them to administer. Um, one thing that I thought that was really important that came out of the presentation to the pandemic team was that of these students, if you, you know, looking back at slide three for the board members that have this in front of you, that when we look at the number of students that were processed and the impact, you know, we, we've got a few hundred students um, of all of those school identified close contacts. My understanding is that I think we had one student who tested positive. So many of these students, almost all of these students that, that are being put into quarantine because of the county guidelines um, end up not being sick, which is wonderful. Um, so to me, that means that the, the risk of, of having these students in a modified quarantine is minimal as well. And I think it's important to reiterate that the default option in all of this is not to test students. If we can't get a hold of a parent, no test is administered. Um, if we can't confirm information, no test is administered. So um, there is no scenario where a student is being tested without full parental knowledge and consent. And I think that's really important as well. Thanks, Mrs. Aubrey Larsenis. Uh, questions from members of the board. Uh, Mr. McGinnis. Just for clarity on the process, student comes in, um, and has been identified as closed contact. The, we'll call it the permission slip to test has been received, it's in working order. The test is administered and they test positive. The next test will be 48 hours later, administered by us, correct? No. Okay. So, so um, if at any time uh, that a test is issued by us and the and the child is test is positive um the parent is notified and the parent needs to pick the child up to get further testing elsewhere and to uh start the quarantine process per the county guidelines okay yeah we, we're this is i, I want to be clear that this is not a this is not a uh and we're not testing uh people uh that come into us with, with with symptoms so this is this is also, you know, you know, if, if a child is a close contact is coming down and and they have like the symptoms, you know, the, to to test them and uh, as as part of this process is, is not is not part of the, the the strategy. It's for those if those students that are asymptomatic, unvaccinated, and in once they test positive, they have to go into the. Uh, uh, quarantine, the, the option one program. Gotcha. So that kicks them into a whole other category uh, that they follow the, the county guidelines. Okay. That was my question. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions from my, on my right here? 
Ms. Cancro? So are we looking to vote on this for next week to participate in contacting the county or is this just informational at this point? No, this is on the agenda for uh, your consideration next week. Yeah. For to al to allow me to uh, uh, be, you know notify the county to participate. Because I otherwise it, this is going to start early November otherwise I'd I'd be waiting yeah. a number of weeks before I'd get your approval or we'd have to call an emergency meeting and I feel that uh, the county's already committed to this. They just don't have their documents together, uh, me meaning they they won't give they won't give us any of the documents associated with the plan until it's all approved. But we've been on calls with the county Department of Public Health, and they they have explained all that I've explained to you here this evening, um, and th those that's the the basis of this program. Yeah, the one thing I would say is I know that like as a community that we're very conflicted with what's going on and I understand and respect both views. What I will do, I will say is that this, those that do not want to do the vaccine, it allows people to have choice to not have their students be vaccinated. It allows the students to be in school. I will tell you a scenario that happened where if uh, that happened with me, with just in work at a district out in the Harrisburg area, the the therapist, as the therapist goes close to a student and they wore a mask, but as an adult, you have to be six feet apart. But therapeutic wise, they had to be near the student at three feet. They wound up quarantining all 60 students that they treat. If you have a test to stay in school, you're able to have those kids stay in school. It's, it's a frustrating situation, I understand for some, because I know that this is a very, big conflict of discussion, but I just want to let you know that having this test allows students to stay in school, that allows them to, you know, be able to still be within the academic. I, you know, I understand that there's a conflict of interest in, for some people, but the parents have a choice whether they want to get tested or not, so. Yeah, good point, Ms. Kanku. I mean, it's really about, we just provide, you know, your approval of this would give the parent another option. That, that's really, other than what we're, we're doing today. So it's really up to them and, and, and we don't have a preference either way. We just think that uh, this provides, as I said in my first slide, it, it provides the continuity of in-person instruction. Mr. Navarrete. Yeah, thank you for this. I'm glad we're getting in front of it. Um, I think any option that helps keep our kids in the building uh, as opposed to having a quarantine, particularly in elementary school ages where it's a lot more difficult. Um, I think it's fantastic. This is entirely opt-in, as Jen said. You know, this this kind of meets everybody's uh, uh, issues around uh, parent choice. So this is a positive. Um, thank you for bringing this to us. Thanks, Mr. Never. Any other comments from members on the right to my right to my right and to my left, uh, Ms. Drummond? I have questions um, may, that might be like a little into the weeds, maybe. Um, but just as as I'm thinking about the process, you know, so I understand that kids who are asymptomatic are the ones who um, can be tested for this. So, but, but who is, if a, if a student is in this program, who is tracking, tracking if they're asymptomatic or not? Like, is it, and how many symptoms? Or is it any symptoms, one symptom? Is there a daily, like, Google form? Yeah, on the, if, if you recall our, our self-checklist on a daily basis, there's two columns, and I don't have it memorized. I probably should, but I, but I don't. But there's a, there's a column that says if you have these symptoms, any one of these, or, or, or a combination of these. So if you if you would look at that chart, that would tell you, and the nurses already know that. So, okay, so, so it's so the, the that nurse, So the nurse, chart. as a child's in this program, meaning... Uh, they come down after being notified of being in close contact and they're, they're asymptomatic. We test them, uh, given the, the parent permission. In, in the, the two days later, they come to us and now they, they are exhibiting symptoms and they, and they check the, the chart. Now they, they have to make it, the nurse has to make a determination. And so they, would, they, could, they could choose to test them at that point in time, given the symptoms, then send them home, but they're likely going to be sent home. Okay. Um, and then just... Um, point of curiosity, is the, is the test self-administered or is it nurse-administered or does that depend on age or the student? Well, I, I think that um, it certainly can be self-administered uh, at certain levels. And this was a conversation that we had with the, with the nursing staff. At the elementary level, it's likely going to be nurse-administered. Um, at the secondary level uh, for, for these situations, you know, is a child's capable? Again, this is 
as we outlined, it's based on the students' circumstances and whether or not, uh, and their past, you know, experiences with, with the nursing and uh, staff and so forth. So we're going to treat everyone as an adult uh, or as a child based on their, their, their experiences and, and what, what's best suited to make them comfortable and successful in this, in this measure. And then my last question, which we had sort of talked about before, is do you um, do you have confidence in being able to put the nursing support in place to to hire have extra nurses or extra administrative um, you know staff um, to help with this? I just don't want the nurses to be overwhelmed with this extra process. No, absolutely. So uh, you know. The, before before this was even proposed, uh, the the two nurses that are on the uh, pandemic team, we've had a conversation. They've already pre-identified uh, who they think will be uh, the best suit suited because they're they're in contact with with the nurses that uh, support us on a regular basis, and we think that we can, you know, encourage a particular nurse to come back with us and uh, you know off 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 uh, uh, you, know, you know support support this process as well as other uh, you know processes that we have. So we, we, we certainly will uh, make sure that uh, we have the staffing that, that in order to implement it. Okay, thank you. I just, because mm -hmm. our nurses have been doing so much oh, I know. for the past I know. I know. Yeah, absolutely. so many months. And I just- Yeah, we, we, we depend on them daily. I mean, it's- I want it's, 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 be able it's to provide taken, them the support. It's, it's taken their role in the organization at a whole new level. And, uh, you know, certainly we, we recognize that. As, as you know, we, we've given them recognition that as a board. We've given them recognition as an administration. Uh, whatever support we can provide to them, we've, we've been trying to, to give to them. So okay. thank you for that recognition. Other comments, questions, Ms. Hall? I wanted to um, ask if, I'm assuming, if this does get approved next week, we would then still be waiting on a date from the Montgomery County Department of Health as to their approval date. Is that correct? Like they are, is Montgomery County Department of Health having like a launch date for this program? That all the districts can start. Or yes, okay. it's supposed so to start early November. It's supposed to start early November. So they will have an announcement of when it is effective, and we could start doing it. So just the approval doesn't make the program start. It's we're still waiting on the Department of Health. That is correct. All right, thank you. We we, we couldn't start this without all the stuff being put in place. And they say, okay, now you can start. Um. In reference to the staffing, it's indicated here as one nurse, and I walked out, so I may have missed it. Is that one nurse per school or one nurse for? It's a traveling. It's a traveling nurse. It's a team of tra a traveling nurse and a, uh, um, a lay person. Okay, so it will be a team that will travel through the all the schools. That's correct. And then, will we have the testing available at all schools? So they'll travel to all the schools. Yes. And we'll have capacity at all the schools to test. Yeah, we would set up we would set up a, a schedule, and they would fo follow that schedule. And then I have also, what is the length of the testing time? The actual administration of the testing time. Because we currently use this test now for teachers, right? Say that again. We currently use this test now for teachers. We do. I think it's fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. It's close to that if it's not exactly that. Okay, and then but that but that also includes uh, the, the uh, there's a uh, I'll call it uh, for lack of a better term a registration process. Uh, we use what are called QR codes to uh, you know log people in, and 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 we haven't been told yet whether or not that's a requirement because we already have all the student information. We don't necessarily need to we don't need them to come to us and and go through a QR code process. So, um, but the county hasn't determined yet whether or not we are doing that, even though that is part of their program with the volunteer testing. So if that is not part of the process, the time, the timeline will be of, of testing will be shorter. And I, and I don't know what that is, but it, it'll definitely be shorter because part of the, the dilemma is, is, the, is the registration process. You come in, you get the QR code, and sometimes it doesn't always match up or, or hit you know, the, the, the computer device doesn't always capture it properly. So it, it ha you have to reset the device and get that in there properly. And I had, a, I know you said the draft concern form will be available for us to review. Would that be before the um, meeting next week? 
Say that again. The consent form. Yeah, I, I could. I, the, the challenge with the consent form right now is I don't have a, a final determination from the county exactly what is going to be said. All I have is a sample of a consent form based on what the solicitor and I believe is going to be uh, the, the 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 protocol uh, associated with this. So the the consent form may have to be modified, but I can share the the sample with you. But but what we would do is uh, modify the consent form once we have all the details from the county. I, I just I, I can't I can't anticipate that everything will be covered in something I don't have possession of right now. And that would that form are we planning or is the county planning to have that form available electronically? Absolutely. Okay. And I just have one more. In reference to our, um, I guess our current close contacts, and I know we say the number of close contacts are higher than the number that actually test positive based on the close contacts. Do we have a point of reference as far as where those close contacts are being identified? Yes, uh, on the buses and in lunch. As, as, as you're well aware, those are the two locations where distancing isn't 100% all the time and, and nor is a mask being worn. Obviously on the bus, mask being worn, but not at, not at lunch. And that's where, that's where the nurses have indicated those are, are the close contact issues arise. And with the lunch, so we're still using plexiglass, right? Is that for all lunch tables or just certain ones? Well, the, so just so you understand that you know, the plexiglass, while it is a, it is a, is a barrier mm -hmm. and it is a, uh, um, a, a, a reasonable, uh, mitigation matter. It's not considered a mitigation matter in terms of the distancing and masking associated with the county's determination of close contacts. Uh, that may not make sense, but that's what it's been and that's what it's always been. But we've deployed the uh, plexiglass because uh, it just it just makes sense in terms of of, of, of common sense and there, there's there's some there's some proof that that you know helps you know create. Uh, distance between, uh, you know, a vapor uh, being being spread uh, between two people, but nonetheless, it's not considered as part of the county's contact process. Okay, and then just one more for our numbers here that you indicated for the schools. Are they all just from close contacts from the school, or are they like if somebody's kid was sick or tested positive outside of school? Are those numbers in, included here? These are close contacts in the school. In the school. Um, now, now, what that means is, um, you know, there's there's a lot of scenarios here. So uh, I'll try to give you the best one I can. Child, child is in school on Friday, um, goes goes home over the weekend, gets tested. Um, that the the test you know turns up positive, calls the nurse on Monday, says that I tested positive. We have to go back two days. Uh, you know, pr prior to that, it's possible that there could be a close contact on a Thursday and a Friday in, in school because they, they are thought to be positive uh, at a time prior to the uh, the actual test showing. Uh, so, so there are, there are there are a number of circumstances that uh, place uh, students at close contact. Uh, not necessarily is is a child, uh, you know, you know. Uh, positive in school at, at, at that particular time, but but could be tested and become positive uh, at, at a time outside of school, but has within a window uh, been in contact or close contact with other students at lunch, as an example. And the nurses are responsible for confirming vaccinated versus unvaccinated they are. Through, they are. through the vaccine cards, or is there... Do they well, there's a, there's a number of, of methods uh, for that, but they're, they're able to uh, work with parents, uh, uh, healthcare providers uh, to get that information. And uh, our, our parents have been very cooperative as part of that process. And if we can't confirm, um, then we consider, consider the child unvaccinated.
Any other questions? Just a right. couple tiny, everyone pretty much covered everything. So next week it'll be 13D, because it's not on here now probably because you didn't present it. So I'm assuming next week this will be under 13D. Oh, it is? Maybe. Uh, oh, you know what? Maybe I have a, the older one. It, it is 13C. Oh. And it says uh, student modified quarantine program. Okay. I must have the one in the envelope, not the new one. Sorry. And and then. Um, Someone live on Zoom. I don't know when that was printed. Okay. And um, and then so, I, so just just for just for clarification, uh, the one live on and on the uh, website includes the the item, the one that you have in front of you. It must be an older version from Friday that that didn't have it on. Thank you. And then um, the only thing I was just going to say is, um, I hope every school in the county is doing this. I didn't watch where I works board meeting yesterday, but. Just, you know, to add what Jen said, like in my, for my students, I'll have a date next to somebody's name that might say can return on so-and-so date with a negative test. And some children come back quickly because they were able to get a test quickly and some it's the whole time. So I would love <laughs> to have my students back sooner so that if this enables them to do that, that would be awesome. So I'm I'm all for it, and and again because there is parental consent, I understand everybody is different, um, and I respect that. Um, but I think this is great, and thank you for answering all of our questions. And is there is there a chance? Oh gosh, I don't even want to ask it. That the county goes, ah, uh, yeah, we thought it was going to happen, and it's not. It it it, it I mean, I certainly I I imagine. For some reason, they could they could say that, but uh, all the indications suggest that this is going to happen, uh, at least by the county's determination. Uh, Ms. Albulasenis. Yeah, um, I, Ms. Reese, you touched on the one thing that I wanted to bring up, which is that our current process is that a student has the option of getting a test on their own. Correct. So, if a student is identified as a close contact, currently they are sent home. And then they, as part of their quarantine timeline, they have the option of getting a test and coming back sooner or staying out for the full length of the quarantine. That is correct. So they could be back on day, I believe, five or day seven, uh, depending on uh, the, the, the test. Okay. So this yep. also helps students who may not have the means or the, the ability to get tested on their own. Um, you know, it saves parents time off of work and, and all of that, too. Um, which I know has been a big concern for a lot of people through the pandemic. Um, one thing that I would ask in our next conversation with the county, um, because this is a county run program, I'd be curious whether or not they could develop a consent form. I would imagine that that's something that if all schools in the county are gonna be offered this program, that they may have their own consent form if they're the ones that are running the program. Yeah, uh, I'd yeah, be curious to hear about that because I am a little concerned about approving this, not knowing what that consent form looks like. I mean, I know in my mind what it should look like, but that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to match up with the reality of it. So I would, um, I, I I fully support the program, but I I kind of reserve my final decision on when we get this consent form so that we can make sure that it is available. Well, um, I mean, if, you know, depending on what uh, the other board members think about what you just, you just stated there, you know, we're probably not gonna get this approved then um, until November or an emergency meeting. Because I, I, I know from for a fact, the county is not going to have this done before next Tuesday. And if, if that's the case, I can't guarantee you, you know, all the details associated with what, what needs to be into the, uh, to the um, consent form, uh, but I, I can guarantee you that uh, our solicitor uh, is in, in touch with, uh, you know, has, has a, has a two-page consent form that is pretty uh, thorough, and, and maybe it's important for the board to see that draft at this point in time, uh, to see whether or not uh, even the draft, you know, is, is consistent with what uh, you're thinking needs to be done. But the county, the county just made, as you suggested, say here is the consent form. But they haven't, they haven't done that type of thing for us, you know. Uh, so, so I, I was trying to be proactive, getting, getting all the balls in, in, in order. 
but if they certainly give us a consent form, we will use theirs, uh, so long as it, as our solicitor believe that it, it protects the, the our children and our families and our school district. Okay, so then I think what I would want to see for next week is have our consent form on the agenda. Okay. Um, and then if the county comes up with something that somehow deviates from what we've approved, we can revisit it at that point, whether or not we are going to need to have an emergency meeting or something along those lines. Um, if, if there's not a material difference between the two, then, then that's a different conversation. But I just want to make sure that the board is fully informed of what we are approving before we approve it. That, that's uh, that's fair. Any other comments or questions? Okay, that ends our guests and scheduled speakers for this evening. Uh, we'll move on to uh, next week. We have the Award of Excellence, the M Awards. Uh, we'll have reports from all the committees, and uh, we have some advisements. Um, certainly, I just want, I want to bring your attention to two uh, specific advisements. Most of these, the first one through seven, are, are personnel related. The last two are not personnel related. I just want to give you some context around them. Uh, I will be soliciting proposals for professional student enrollment uh, projection services with respect to the catchment areas, and that's generally concerned as the uh, uh, sending uh, areas or the elementary uh, school uh, zones uh, for programming and facility planning. And secondly, uh, I will be soliciting proposals from legal, for legal services with respect to processing right-to-know requests uh, that requ require legal support. Are there any questions from anybody on the, on the board regarding in those two matters? Seeing no questions, we'll move on to, uh, we'll do public comments, uh, we'll approve the, uh, the meeting minutes and then we'll move to fiscal items. Mr. Bricker. Thank you, Dr. Zerby. Uh, this month for your approval, we have the list of bills, treasurer's report, budgetary transfers, the general bond obligations resolution 21-5, the Eagleville Elementary addition and renovations change order number three, a credit of $45,428, and a 2022 project for the Eagleville Roofing with regards to Mark Sobeck as presented tonight. Thank you, Mr. Bricker. Any questions from Mr. Bricker on uh, any matters related to uh, fiscal items? Uh, Mr. Winters? So how, how do we decide on the amount on 9DA? Have we... Do we discuss that here at uh, what the direction we need to provide, or is it open ended and decided later? Or, um, I, first, uh, personally, I would like to just stay with the the amount that was thirteen and a half, um, but I don't know if we need to give you that direction right now. So I would the need, agenda item is um, I would need the direction by the end of next week, the uh, board meeting when we vote. Okay. So that we, oops, sorry, we leave the amount generic open ended. And until we vote next week, you, you got to give me a number to shoot for that we would go for. Yeah, but shouldn't we discuss so, so that we, right so now? So we have, yeah, so, so we, need, we need to discuss that this evening. So uh, the, uh, you, know, you know, I know we had some conversation at the finance committee meeting on, on, the, on the matter. Is there, are there any comments, uh, at least from the finance committee members? Because you spent most of the time on, on this conversation, more so than maybe some of other uh, yeah, I mean, just a point of clarification, right? We, every time we do this, the uh, the resolution itself has a larger number in it than our target, right? That's so they have flexibility in terms of what their uh, their ultimate um, buy is or their ultimate issue is. Um, so that in itself isn't concerning. But I, I do want to dial back to exactly where um, where we end up because I guess I'm not inclined to go forward with the full 18. Um, I can pull up my notes if we want to talk about this. Now we can do it next week, but and maybe it's worth, uh, you know, revisiting again um, the full list of projects. But when we look at the amount needed to get to the end of what we've committed to already, without using funds that are in our capital reserve, it gets us to just over twelve million. Correct, twelve and a half, something along those lines. So the amount of money we need, not using the committed the capital reserve funds as outlined in the master plan financials that were presented to the finance committee is about 13.1 million dollars so if we borrow 13.5 that would put us with four hundred thousand dollars of wiggle room that does not include any amounts of money we'll have to spend for the design of the 2022 summer projects 
or the potential cost of another $1.1 million of those. If we factor those in, you're probably looking at, say, another 1.5, so roughly 15 at a minimum to cover through the summer projects. If we don't, somewhere along the line, we will have to borrow next year. And if we will probably need to borrow if we just go to the 15, again, because you're gonna start the process of the design phase in, in this fall next year, and we'll be we're needing funds for that also. Yeah, which is typically what we do every mm -hmm. year, right? We're doing that, we're having the same discussion. So yeah, I, I think I think you just came up with the number there. I, I think it's probably closer to 15. And that gets us through next summer with one issuance. Mr. Winters, is, 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 yeah. does that make, so the, does that make sense? The, one, the 13 and a half to 15, the difference is the summer projects that are preparing us primarily for the high school improvements in the following year. Is that correct, Gener generically? It's the Eagleville roof and the BAS at the high school. Are there any uh, comments from anyone else in regards to uh, you know a, a particular uh, interest in, in a number that we need to be putting in here for the resolution? Yeah, Ms. Cancro. No, at the finance committee meeting, we did discuss that there if there were possibilities of other projects that we were going to maybe focus on, like the like a health and fitness center, or looking and reviewing at the Arcola Road for transportation of buses to come in and out of and, and paving that because there's an immediate need dealing with transportation there. So there were discussions about wish list items. I thought one thing that I thought they were going to really go over was perhaps the fees, the increases in payments as we increase in our amount, unless it stays the same. Um, that was one clarification that I thought was going to be brought up, but we had just discussed potential items that could help to improve that were not already on the master plan. So that's why that 18 came up. So um, we don't have a definite plan in that sense. So. so the fees would be, as Zach said earlier, about an additional $50,000. You're always going to pay for the amount of money you borrow. So if you borrow five thousand five million dollars less now and five million dollars later, we'll assume those will be about a wash on what they are. But you will have the cost for legal and all the other pieces that go with that, and that'll be um, about fifty thousand um, dollars. So that is the one thing. The other thing that was mentioned when Zach did this presentation back to the finance committee is would be where the interest rates is. Interest rates could go up. Interest rates could go down. As Mr. Navarrete noted, the one time, one year, we, we couldn't make out any better, but the, the realistic chance of interest rates staying low forever are not there. So that's the only other risk is the rates would go up. Yeah, and I'll just add, and Drew, you, you can go next, is um, the, um, I lost my whole train of thought. <laughs> uh, if it, I know what I was gonna point out. When we look at the coming, summer, right? We borrow now, it gets us through the projects for next summer. When we start to look at 2023, we're back on a full master plan cycle, right? We'll have, we'll have gone through the Arrowhead, the Eagleville. We've talked about the way we limited ourselves in, in other master plan work over these three years of summers of 2021 and 22, right? We, we kept ourselves in that nine to $10 million range over those three years. We'll be back to a normal cycle with a full list of projects, right? And the first thing that that's on our docket that we've talked about before that we postponed was the, um, or excuse me, that we decided not to pull forward, um, is the high school MEP work, right? And how we phase that work over the next, you know, whether we do it over two years or one year, how, how we do it, how it interferes with the school year. So we'll be back when we get to that part of the project and we start looking at the end of next year and how we borrow for that project. We'll be looking at bigger dollar amounts at that point. We'll be back to our normal, you know, we're talking about seven, eight, nine million dollars again. So that's my, my suggestion is now, if we're going to go after a number, we go after a number of what we absolutely have planned now, because we'll be back un under our normal cycle after that. Not since we also talked about the STEM Academy. That was the other area that we were looking at as a as a strategic plan. But I think I agree that we should really go back to the facility and have a better identified what the goals of the district are before we go. And we're yeah. just not prepared to 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 take that much when it's not identified. Yeah, without the projects on the books, and we've talked about a lot of the things, I, I, I'm not inclined to go in that direction. 
So, and, and just to make this clear, Mr. Bricker, you're saying that we need 15? Is that what you're saying? At a minimum, we would need 15 to get through December of 2022 projects. Is there anybody that has an objection to that uh, recommendation at this moment of time? And that's what we'll put on 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 for the uh, the resolution, and uh, we will then take up uh, as after the after we go through the strategic planning process and have conversations about some of these other facilities, uh, take up greater detail and interest in you know how those other projects might uh, come to uh, a realization in in the future, and, and and then the board can consider those things at, at, in the appropriate time frame. Yeah, and just to be clear, Tim, the the resolution that we're going to see isn't going to say 15, right? It's going to say something more like 17 or 18. It always gives us the ability to go up to that number 18. Yes. All right, thank you. Any other, any other questions on finance matters? Seeing none, we move on to personnel items. Uh, Dr. Sergini. Good evening again. For your consideration this month, we have the following personnel items. One resignation professional, Pamela Craig, teacher of fifth grade at Skyview. We thank Pam for her many years of dedicated service to the students of Methacton and to the entire Methacton community, and we wish her well in her future professional pursuits. Three resignations classified, Amy Bacone, recess assistant at Woodland, Megan Zellner, paraprofessional at Eagleville, and Donna Nar, part-time attendance secretary at Arcola, resignation for retirement. We thank Donna especially for her many years of dedicated service to the Methacton School District, and we wish her all the very best in her retirement. One employment professional, Jacqueline Eppolito, teacher of seventh grade English at Arcola. We're happy to welcome Jackie to Methacton, and we look forward to the good work that she'll do with our students and in our community. Two employments classified, Matthew Barr, accounting specialist at Farina and Christina Rao, power professional at Methacton High School. We're happy to welcome both Matt and Cassie to Methacton and look forward to the good work that they'll do with our students and in our community. We have six changes of status, status rather, professional as listed below. These are six uh, teachers who will be moving into full day kindergarten positions beginning at the start of the 2022-2023 school year. Identifying these individuals now will allow them to participate in appropriate professional development activities throughout the remainder of the current school year and specific building assignments will be identified later in the spring. We have one uncompensated leave professional as identified, one uncompensated leave classified as identified, and a series of supplemental contracts including Rebecca Kubler, assistant high school girl swim coach, retroactively approving ELD department instructor parent information night, IEP writing, mentor and bus duty contracts, retroactively approving Christine Hamill as World Language Program Coordinator, approving a new mentor contract for a new hire, approval of additional activity sponsors, approval of boost program instructors, and also approval of winter season coaches. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Sujani? Ms. Reese? Um, kindergarten teachers, um, are we now staffed for full day kindergarten? We anticipate that we are. We conducted a series of interviews, and these are the six individuals who emerged from the interviews who we anticipate moving into those positions. And as I said, we'll be able to do professional development so that we're prepared for the full day kindergarten in the fall of 2022. Okay. And then are we worried at all about losing? And I'm glad that they're going where they want to go. I have no issue with that whatsoever. But are we worried about filling five special education positions? There will be certain movements that transpire throughout the district based on our new programming. And then also this allows us the time to begin to advertise positions in the coming months so that we are able to properly fill those positions. And... Um, my other question was, I think, oh, um, the new seventh grade English instructor, I, I'm assuming she's coming from another school district and hence why she's starting in January. She oh. is. Okay. I did a little Google search on that. Thank you. Um, and, um, just wanted to, uh, publicly thank Pam Craig, who's just a phenomenal educator and wish her well, just like you did. And I will also let you know that our poor boys are in overtime 
for their playoff game for soccer. So both of our teams have made it to overtime. Well, so I guess that's why they call it a playoff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reese. Uh, Ms. Purdue. In reference to um, resignations, um, are you still conducting exit interviews? I have, yes. So do you generally conduct them after we approve or before we approve? It all depends on the individual. Some want them. Some we know why they're leaving and uh, they aren't interested in an exit interview. So it all depends on the in individual. Okay. And I'm just wondering, in that, in regards to that, are you gathering any information that's helpful for us as far as moving forward? In, in gathering that information, there is nothing hard and fast that uh, would uh, lump all of those individuals together. We, we've talked a little bit before about the fact that some individuals uh, have moved on to uh, other districts for particular reasons, including proximity to home. Um, but generally, there is not a, a complete trend that I can identify with those who have left. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Perdue. Any other questions for Mr. Su or Dr. Sujini? Uh, Ms. Abirasanis? Yes, for the um, full day kindergarten teachers, are any of our current kindergarten teachers then converting to full day kindergarten teachers? We, we have current kindergarten teachers in place. The majority of them will be remaining as kindergarten teachers. There is the possibility that not all who are currently in those positions will remain in those positions. Okay, so I'm assuming then that they don't need to have their change of status approved right now because they are currently in a kindergarten teaching role, so they could still do the same type of professional development that these individuals are doing. Correct. Okay, I uh, just want to make sure that we're going to, everybody's going to be up to speed. And then um, looking at the supplemental contracts, um, what avenues are we pursuing to fill some of these coaching positions as we are wrapping up our fall season and heading into the winter? I have good news. I spoke to Dr. Spiewak this evening around five o'clock and he has been conducting interviews throughout this week and he has more interviews scheduled tomorrow. So I believe that we are moving in a positive direction in the majority of the, uh, the coaching positions. The one that I can tell you that is very difficult to fill is the diving coach. And we've traditionally had difficulty filling that, but we do have a plan for our, our students who participate in diving to still be able to do so with coaching from our current swimming staff. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. abdul uh, Mr. Winters? Yeah, uh, also a uh, shout out to Ms. Craig, who's been involved in the Act 48 and many committees, MEF, and has gone above and beyond as a uh, staff member for many years and wish her the best of luck in their new endeavors. Um, congratulations on filling the accounting specialist. I don't know how long that has been on the open list in various forms. So, um, good to see that one filled. So the, the kindergarten, I'm also asking about the special ed certs, obviously what sticks out here is that we're taking five special ed teachers and putting them as a full day kindergarten instructors. Um, the one does not, I assume that the sixth probably has a special ed cert. Or are we, so my question would just straight up is, is there a requirement for special ed cert to teach kindergarten? For the newly created full day positions that we advertised for, there was the requirement to be duly certified in both elementary education and special education. Yeah, and that's for every teacher, not just one for each school, correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then also uh, uh, appreciate that the uh, Miss Hamill has, uh, come out for the World uh, Language Program Community and we filled one of those positions. So thank you there. Thank you, Mr. Winters. Any other, any other comments from members of the board for, or questions for Dr. Sergini? Seeing no other questions, thank you, Dr. Sergini. Thank you. Next, we move on to curriculum. I believe we have uh, Dr. Walsh uh, this evening. Dr. Walsh. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Zerby. Good evening, everyone. For your review and consideration, listed are the following items, which were also shared at the Ed Committee meeting that was held on October 5th. Uh, under Advisement Act 158 of 2018, it's the Pathways to Graduation um, under the recommendations of PDE. And again, this was also shared in detail at the October 5th meeting of the Ed Committee. Um, also under New Curriculum for the action to be taken next month, November of 2021, Women in America, 
plan course document for women in America, social studies elective. It's a uh, one semester course will be available for review at the district office for the next 30 days. It'll be brought forward for approval at next month's action meeting. Um, and the board has been provided this document. Also for your action next week is two plan course document revisions. One is the um, fact in high school physical education per act seven of 2019 requires CPR training in grades nine through 12. So again, those revisions were made to the plan course documents and you can see those reflected in those documents that were sent out to all of you. Also forensic psychology approved revisions to the forensic psychology plan course document and to reflect the pacing guides, assessments and learning activities. Again, the board was provided an update at the ed committee meeting. And then for your review and consideration, the new course proposal, um, looking for action next week to write the English 12 career at connections. It's to prove development of a new full year one credit course for next school year, the 2022, 2023 academic school year. And again, those curriculum documents will be brought forward in the spring of 2022, as we do with all new, all new textbooks and curriculum um, for the upcoming school year. And that's it for my report for this month. Questions for Dr. Walsh on my right. Seeing no questions on my left. Seeing no questions. Thank you, Dr. Walsh. We Thank appreciate you. your time this evening. Next on the agenda, we have policy, Dr. or Mr. Regina. Thank you, Dr. Zerby. A couple items for policy, uh, 007 policy manual access. I'm at shifting this to predominantly an online access for individuals, no longer having the uh, physical copies at the district office, although we will have a laptop present and we can print off copies for those that aren't able to use the laptop if if they so desire. Uh, the 13, 113 series, um, not many changes in this specifically, uh, but we do have some revisions to the pronouns, uh, keeping those consistent with the, what the PSBA recommendations are. Uh, again, with he, she, they, his, her, their, and him, her, them and child custody, there was some revisions to the transportation uh, language. And that will complete everything on policy. Thank you, Mr. Regina. Any questions for Mr. Regina on policy matters? Seeing none, we move on to other. Uh, there's gifts and donations approved the backpack program donation from the Lower Providence Presbyterian Church of $210. Approved the donation of a World Sir Piano uh, Andrea Cronin, a donation of $1,000. Uh, approve the donation of Methacton High School Theater Company of Costume Accessories, Mr. Salvador uh, Pumo Sr. And on behalf of Beverly Cantrell and Casey Parkinson, donation of $6,000. Approve the backpack program donations received from generous individuals uh, noted on the attached documents as listed for $471.39. No trips, a student modified uh, quarantine program is listed uh, on the agenda for your consideration and the, and the approval of the pay survey administration is listed. And that ends the agenda items. Uh, we go on to dates for uh, members calendars and I turn it over to uh, our board president. Thank you, Dr. Zerby. Just real quick in the, the um, agenda that came out that is printed out for the audience that item four the uh, additional testing is not listed as well, not just our copy. Yeah, so it, the, the, the agenda that is posted online that was posted 72 hours prior to uh, tonight's meeting is uh, the one that includes the, uh, uh, the modified quarantine. Uh, unfortunately, and I'm not certain, but I'll, I'll find out why all the copies don't include that. But likely that was because it was it was printed on Friday before. I, I normally work after Friday. I, just trying to clarify to yeah. make sure that it will no, be on the item sure. for the audience. All right. Does anyone have any older new business to bring up this evening, Ms. Kankra? Um, this just goes back to talking about the quarantining and in the lunchroom with the plexiglass. I just want to see if we could request back to the pandemic team to review the utilization of plexiglass in the lunchrooms. If the kids are not sitting in a plexiglass around the, themselves, that it's open on these sides. And if we are going to be going to, we've got six weeks of data. I just want to see if, the, if you could look at that and utilize that because it's not something that utilizes a Montgomery County barrier. Montgomery County tells us we have to wear these masks, but when it comes to the plexiglass, we now have six weeks of data. So if we can look at that and just review that, um, 
I think it's just fair for our students to be able to not eat with plexiglass between their neighbors if it's not. So I just want to look at it, please. We can do that. Thank you. Anyone else with anything for older new business? I just wanted to, um, uh, I, I last meeting, um, and I, I forgive me, I'm probably going to say your name wrong, so I, I won't say it, but a, a woman in the audience brought up Lower Marion, and I thought her points were good that she had lived there and, and now lives here. And I told, I, do, I did too, but way long time ago in my early 20s, um, before I was thinking schools. But as an educator and as a parent, you always look, and you know, Lower Marion's top ranked in Montgomery County and Radnor's top ranked in Delaware County and her different East Town is top ranked in Chester County. We've got the main line. And so anyway, it, it made me kind of look at Lower Marion since you had brought it up. And I just wanted um, to point out, because your points were good, were good points, that if you go onto their website, they're um, due to some things that have occurred in the last five years, 10 years, I'm not sure how long, their DEI section is and initiatives are in extensive. And I just, I wanted, because I, I forget exactly the wording that you use, but I just, just wanted to let you know that because I think districts are always trying to look at other districts to see what is happening, what isn't happening, what's good, best practices, et cetera. So I, I wanted to bring that to your attention because you make a good point that you know everyone wanted to be Lower Marion and you were saying everyone wanted to be Mathacton and, and we do sometimes look at our neighboring districts and those rankings and things like that to look at those things. So I, I meant to bring that up last meeting but it was a long night so I'm glad you're here again. All right, anyone else before we move on to courtesy of the floor? All right, so at this time, we will take comments from the public for courtesy of the floor. This is a time for you to speak about anything that could come before the district at any date. We ask you to keep your comments to four minutes or less. We may respond to matters following conclusion of the comments. And uh, as always, introduce yourself with your name and municipality. And maybe we don't have to be so polite. Everybody could. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of you go first, you go first. Jim Mollick, Worcester. Uh, I was interested in Mr. Navarrete's comments on the substitute situation, and he felt that they should uh, be kept because they're quality. Uh, you know, I agree we should keep quality people, but I don't think the problem is money. The problem is the environment. Uh, under one of my many right to know requests, I got the teacher survey. I would suggest put the teacher survey up on the screen there, and you'll understand why you can't keep qualified, good people here at the school. They're not happy with upfront. So if you want me to show you the survey, I'll, I'll show you the survey. Um, what is the endpoint for COVID? Two years now. Two years. You guys are still talking about quarantine? Quarantine's used when the virus first starts to prevent it from becoming a pandemic. Uh, what's the end point? The virus is not going anywhere. It's here. So you better start to deal with it or we're going to be doing this for the next 20, 25 years. Um, I have a quote. Um, In our system of hyper-localized control, the haves will always be able to and will always choose to spend more than the haves not. Maybe it's time to start a conversation about consolidating the 500 school districts in Pennsylvania as one way of addressing funding inequity. <laughs> There's a good one. Anybody want to take credit for that quote? I'll give it to Mr. Navarrete because it was his quote and he was sharing it with somebody named Shay Ash. Anybody know Shay Ash? 
Turns out Shay Ash is in the news. President to the school board of That's not Norris relevant County. to Methacton. I'm sorry. Uh, well, you may think it's not, but I do. And let me explain it. Um, these conversations were occurring with this guy, Shay Ash, who apparently has been sending inappropriate texts to young girls. I was wondering whether Mr. Navarrete knew that or not when he was communicating with the guy. No, I'm sorry. You're out of line on this one. You think so? I do. Explain, explain why. It's not a matter for the board. It's not no, relevant. No, that's to what the board. you think. Okay, that's what on. you think. Your clock it's is still running. It's embarrassing to you, Your and clock that's is why. Still and that's why it's a problem. Um, I want to know who are the haves and who are the have-nots. Maybe Mr. Navarre can tell us. Um, and you know, does Mr. Navarre disagree with local control? With you guys control Methacton? We should have Norristown control Methacton and everybody else. Uh, I disagree. Okay. Are you saying the board doesn't have enough money to spend this board? $3 million surpluses every year for four years. You don't have enough money funding and equity. Um, I think I've heard it all. Okay. And Mr. Navarrete's mindset and priorities are the reason that our state ranking plummeted from 11 to 77. Because the focus isn't on education. It's indoctrination and all the rest of this stuff. Um, you know, Mr. Navarrete states, with regards to state rankings and PSSA scores, he stated publicly, those are not the measures by which we make all of our decisions. Uh, I rest my case. Thank you. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Good evening. My name is Lisa Yannick. I live in Eagleville and I taught in Methacton schools for 37 years. I was privileged to open Arrowhead Elementary School in 1975. Staff and students were all aware that Arrowheads had been discovered during the excavation and building of this new school and that a display case of examples was prominently placed in the lobby. I'm into my 70s and I still value education and learning new information, especially from those with experiences different from mine. Several months ago, I participated in an educational Zoom meeting in our community that was led by women who were actual Native Americans. I later found out that the meeting was recorded without permission, and a question that I asked was used to attack this board, and I am here to make sure this community hears from me, not people trying to use my words to create a false narrative. When teaching social studies at Arrowhead, we taught about the homes, the traditions, the beliefs, transportation, and, a fo and food of the Lenai Lenape people who had lived right on the land around our building. We felt that we honored the memory of these people by discussing them. In this community education Zoom, I asked an innocent question about the name Methacton and whether the name of Arrowhead could ever be deemed inappropriate. The question came from my genuine interest in the perspective of the speakers. The speaker answered in the form of a question, why are there none of the Lenai Lenape people still living on the land? Which shocked and humbled me. I had never given the fact of their annihilation and forced removal a thought and had not, it had not been part of my curriculum. The speaker did not advise that we should rush out and change the name Arrowhead or Methacton, and any insinuation that this was the end result of this educational Zoom is intentionally false and divisive. I walked away with new information about the experiences of these Native women and learned that we should be more thoughtful when we consider names and imagery that, are, that originate from Native Americans. I've never seen this community so divided, and I wanted to set the straight record straight. 
I call Lower Providence home, and I value this community too much to see it being torn apart over a lie. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lorraine Cantman. I've been a resident of Trooper for 23 years, and I will continue on Lisa's topic. Um, I'm reading a letter that we've received on behalf of the Nantico Lenny Lenape Tribal Council. Recently, our tribal leaders and citizens have been approached by various individuals and institutions on the topic of the American Indian mascots for both school and professional sports teams. Some have wanted clarification on the tribe's position on such matters, uh, especially regarding mascots. Some have requested that a particular mascot receive tribal approval or support by use by a team. It is necessary to address the issue in a statement that can be circulated and used as a guide by both our own tribal people and the general public. American Indian sports mascots have been popularly used by the non-tribal public for generations. The use of such mascots often include or quickly dissolves, devolves into inaccurate and derogatory depictions of regional tribal culture. It tends to promote the presumptuous wearing of American Indian quote unquote costumes by team supporters and incorporates the use of offensive and stereotypical nomenclature. Teams associated with such activity often demean traditional tribal roles. This is typically excused as merely meaningless quote unquote sporting fun or even as a way of quote unquote honoring American Indian heritage. On occasion, a single person of American Indian descent is pointed to as having given approval for the use of such a mascot, wrongfully allowing a, continuous, a continuing contempt for the wishes of local tribal communities affected by such use. The National Congress of American Indians, the Alliance of Colonial Era Tribes, and the Confederation of Sovereign Nantico Lenape Tribes have all issued statements regarding the impact of American Indian mascots in sports as promoting cultural misunderstanding, racist stereotypes, the mishandling of tribal symbols, the disrespecting of sacred objects, and the trivializing of the continuing struggle of tribal communities. As a voting tribal government within each of those organizations, our tribal nation supports their previously stated positions, and we are keenly aware of the deleterious psychological effects and social impacts that such mascots and the atmosphere they tend to promote have on tribal youth. For these reasons, the Nantico Lene Lenape tribal nation shall not approve or support the use of American Indian mascots by non-tribal sports teams. That is the end of the letter. On a personal note, in my household, um, I'm, I'm noting that the um, Braves and the Dodgers are tied five to one in the bottom of the eighth. We are hoping that the Braves lose solely because we cannot stand that tomahawk chant in our living room. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shannon Chase, and I live in Lower Providence, um, and I've lived there um, for a while now. Um, I wanted to share with you a letter on the same topic. Um, put on my glasses. Um, I received from Barbara Blue Jay McCoskey, a spokeswoman for the, tri the Tribal Nation of the Lenape Nation in Pennsylvania. So this is obviously our, the people who live around here. 
Um, as I was informed earlier this month, she cannot come to speak because she is not a stakeholder in Mathacton School District. Um, so I'll speak on her behalf and I'll read her letter. Um, she says, and she is from the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. Um, thank you for reaching out to us and asking us for our opinion. We really appreciate it. We definitely do not prefer the use of mascots and logos in any form. Um, in regards to honoring us, we feel too often our mascots and logos allow for misrepresentation of our ways and our ceremonies. We do not, we would prefer if you, we would prefer for us to give you a presentation so you can learn about our culture. You can ask for more information by contacting us at Facebook Messenger through our two pages, Len Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania and the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania Cultural Center. Um, I will send this information to the board as well um, so you can look at it. You can also contact us on our website with the questions regarding our culture. Our, nat our national email address is listed below and I'll send that to you as well. Thank you very much for your um, concern and thoughtfulness um, and you, your thoughtfulness is most welcome. And this is signed, Barbara Blue Jay Malaski. On a personal note, um, my sister, my oldest sister is adopted and she is a full blood Native American. She was adopted 55 years ago and she just found her biological family. This is very near and dear to me because my children in Methacton School District wear a Native American mascot symbol on their Im the imagery. It's offensive to me as in my family and it's offensive to my sister. If it offends anyone, I just don't understand why we have to have it at all. It's offending, it's offensive to me personally. So thank you for your time. Good evening. Um, I'm Jennifer Maslow and I live in the Evansburg section of Lower Providence. Um, on October 18th, the Lower Providence Patch, which is an online newspaper, posted a headline, The Facton No Plans to Change Warriors Team Name or Mascot. In a message to families, Superintendent Dr. Zerbe says there are currently no plans to change the Facton's team name or mascot. That's what um, the article had said. I'd like to hear from Dr. Zerbe about his statement. Is this accurate? I read your letter and it seems you were saying the name wouldn't change. The name Warrior would stay the same. Alternately, the logo will not stay the same. The native profile imagery and a headdress will be phased out. Can you clarify about this statement or any decision about the school mascot? To follow up, I'm reading a letter from Chief Chet Brooks from the Coalition of Natives and Allies. This is a letter um, dated May 26, 2020, and it's from the Coalition of Native and Allies who are um, from Langhorne, Pennsylvania. Um, the Delaware Tribal Council of the Delaware Tribe of Indians does not support nor endorse the use of any American Indian or Native American imagery in the form of school or athletic team mascots no matter the intent or justification by any school or organization. We assert such imagery in this context denigrates, degrades, and stereotypes American Indian or Native American people and their culture. Um, from Chief Chet Brooks. So, thanks. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Well, anyone who, uh, anyone who thinks compound interest is the strongest force in the universe has never experienced white guilt. Name you know, I, I had a solid four I'm minutes. Sorry. Name yes. a municipality. Oh, I'm so sorry. Vince Josephs, War Sister, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. And, you know, I had a solid four minutes written down and, and really got derailed about some, some of the topics that came up tonight. 
Um, be before I get too far, anyone watching at home, go back to around 8.19 p.m. I'd roughly peg that at about 1.19. Uh, in the middle of the COVID uh, safety conversation, one of the board members took their mask off to sneeze. Gross. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm choking on the irony. Um, but here's the thing. So uh, Mr. Zerby gets up and he shows this cuckoo bananas draconian quarantine plan. And then um, thank you for the political theater that you all put on acting surprised as if you never, as if you never saw it before. The, uh, the vote on it which happens to happen next week, which happens to be the last meeting in one week before the school board election. Um, I also find very interesting timing wise. I also find it interesting that the, uh, let's see, the three members of the board running for re-election, and that would be uh, Liz Drummond, Jennifer Cancro, and Ralph Navarrete, who have pretty much spent the last six months at board meetings doing the uh, meeting equivalent of hiding in their basement. They don't have a lot of opinions. I rarely hear them speak. Suddenly, I got to punch my dance card as each one of them. God, like you all had great questions and concerns about parents and what we think. What a delightful change. Thank you. For the performance, thank you. Take a bow. Uh, so... Again, what, really a lot to unpack in that quarantine uh, presentation, and I'll try to get the notes that I had. But the, you know, the things that really stuck out to me were the who's a close contact. Um, one, uh, I really hope you thought about the any stigma about who's unvaccinated versus vaccinated, whether or not you're, regardless of your opinions on that, we're talking about the kids and stigma, and that's important. Uh, but who's a close contact? Uh, let's see, unvaccinated kids on buses and at lunch. Do you foresee any issues with kids maybe starting to, that don't want to be part of this quarantine process? Perhaps maybe socially distancing themselves away from the unwashed, the unvaccinated on the bus? Would it be okay if the unvaccinated kids sat in the front of the bus or at the lunch counter? Are there any history teachers sitting up front today? No, I didn't think so. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll save my four minutes for next week, but I, I, I'm just, I, I'm disgusted. That's, that's all I got. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Good evening, John Andrews, Lower Providence. <clears throat> I speak this evening to the board, not just the board president. Having attended numerous public meetings here, here or, or at the LGI, I find virtually zero evidence that you find any value in suggestions offered at courtesy of the floor by your public meeting after meeting. Admittedly, these meetings prime purpose is to conduct district business, but there is the secondary purpose to hear your public here in the public school for the district. <clears throat> A glaring example was your silence a year ago when confronted with about 600 in opposition to rebuilding school. So perhaps your actions as directors are the result of inaction or emotion as to why enrollment here continues to decline. I've spoken previously about the large percentage changes in enrollment unique to Methacton in this county. We are usually patient and sometimes current issues <clears throat> uh, are resolved at our polling places. Soon you'll see the vote counts 
and and you may have to contend with the votes of the public. Thank you. Jessica Bradbury, Lower Providence Township. With regards to the construction borrowing, wasn't there roughly $3 million in surplus from last year that you decided to allocate to future construction projects in June? Has that been factored into the decision tonight on how to borrow, how much to borrow? Or is that $3 million still sitting around somewhere essentially unallocated? I wholeheartedly support that our ultimate goal is to keep our children in school but I'd like to know how the board feels about having different quarantine policies for students that are vaccinated versus students that are unvaccinated. Does that make sense to you? Are students in other counties across the Commonwealth subject to these same illogical rules? Is it true that there were vaccinated Methacton students that tested positive for the virus and sent our kids into quarantine? If you're working closely with the Montgomery County Board of Health, could you lobby for them to change the quarantine guidelines since they don't make sense? You're standing there quietly and allowing the mistreatment, even punishment of our students based on their medical history and their vaccination status. As a district, are we tracking how many days across how many students have been asynchronous learning this year, either due to building issues like an alarm malfunction or due to quarantine? How are you measuring the quality of those asynchronous days? I've talked to parents and students are able to complete the assigned work in 30 to 60 minutes in some cases. Is that really a satisfactory substitute for an entire day of in-person learning? Have you completed the benchmark testing in the elementary schools yet this year? When will that data be presented? When was the last time that this board reviewed data around our student achievement, absenteeism, or interventions, I think it's been months, maybe January, where we reviewed only four months of last year's data. How are the kids doing? Regarding the PA Youth Survey, I see that Methacton has enrolled in the online version and that our students will be provided a link to complete the survey. Where would those responses be stored? Is the survey being conducted by an outside agency and just proctored by the district? As discussed during previous meetings, there is no minimum participation for us to be eligible for the benefits of that survey. Is that correct? We can have one student and still receive those benefits, right? Uh, PA Title 22, Chapter 4, Item 4D states, school entities shall adopt policies to assure that parents or guardians have the following. Section 5, the right to have their children excluded from research studies or surveys conducted by entities other than the school entity unless prior written consent has been obtained. Isn't it true that Springboard solicitor informed them that the pay survey must be given as opt-in? So why is Methacton giving it as opt-out? What are the consequences for not following state law? Can you verify that our school district has not shared any personally identifiable information or protected information as governed by Methacton School Board Policy 235.1, which would include things like student names, parent names, or mental and psychological problems of the student or student's family? I believe Dr. Angstead said questions like that would be asked. Does that go against our policy? Should we uh, update the policy, Ms. Hull? Could the district provide more information about how the results of this survey have been used to secure grants in the past? It can be used, but has it been used? How much have we obtained? How much has the district received? Let's just be transparent. Thank you. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Sheila Smith, Lower Providence, Methacton School parent for 20 years. I have written several emails during dating back to September 6th, left voicemails, requested meetings, and posted questions on the CARE Facebook page only to be blocked from posting and sending further messages. 
I have yet to receive any answers to my questions, so I am forced to ask these questions in a public forum with the hope of receiving truthful and timely responses. Since I am limited to four minutes, I will focus on only two areas of my request. The first is around the DEI resources and audit. The board president has posted DEI resources on the public website funded by taxpayers. What was the selection criteria used for these resources? Who are the vetted qualified approvers? What qualifications do these approvers have? What is the approval process? What consideration was given to those resources, how those resources may impact each student and perhaps conflict with their values and belief and ideologies? Methacton School District paid Dr. Campbell $30,000. What did he deliver? What, where is Dr. Campbell's audit report? I am a member of the DNI committee. I develop DNI strategies. What was presented in each meeting and at the public presentation last month was not an audit. Where is the analysis of current policies and procedures? Who currently in the district is performing DNI responsibilities? I have this data. What are we doing well? Where are the vi verifiable gaps based on actual data, not ideologies from very liberal committee members? Requests have been made for the DNI survey questions and actual results. People have been told to file a right to know request. Why? We are our right to know requests have increased over 37% and we're almost at a million dollars for that. Although discrimination and prejudice are not uncommon, it, it, the impact is, and data matters, where is the data for methactin? Where is the number of incidents, the number of police reports, the number of safe to say notifications? That'll be a topic for another day. The second topic, educational excellence. The top three critical success factors for student engagement and performance are parents, teachers, and learning resources. The total cost for text ports and resources for the 2021 year was $181,742.73. That's less than 2% of the $113 million budget. Yet, Methacton School District paid Panana... Panama, excuse me, I can't say it, 53,000 to collect information on our students' social and emotional learning. Has anyone, anyone, including myself, who has experience and expertise in survey design and analysis, knows that this survey contains systematic error by selecting or encouraging one outcome or answer to lead to predetermined desired results. It also has no controls. You can take the survey multiple times. Next, 70% of the $113 million budget goes to school administration, support maintenance, and teacher salaries and benefits. The allocation between those three groups are not reflected in the 2021-22 final budget. According to this budget, there are approximately 400 teachers and 250 215 professionals. That's 53% of the positions in Methacton School District are support and secondary roles. Minimal direct interaction with our children. Fun fact, an administrator makes about 53% more than a teacher. So with that, last November, the board approved $700,000 in additional annually, annual salary for new administration roles. Meanwhile, six new, teach, new, six new resignations and the Thackton School District eliminated three teaching positions, all due to, to decline to in enrollment. I okay. need to ask you to wrap it up. All right, well, this is a big one, so I will wrap it up. The special education, so no, last year- I need you to wrap it up now. I will continue next week, thank you. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Uh, Brian Earnshaw, Lower Providence. Um, some questions regarding two items that were on the approved last week, or last month's meeting. Um, the elimination of the three vacant teaching positions. Um, were those positions budgeted? And if so, why were, the, why were they budgeted for if they were vacant? And then why were they eliminated three months into the fiscal year? By budgeting for these positions that you knew were probably not needed, it resulted in an unnecessary tax increase. And it also demonstrates the need for this board to review a detailed personnel schedule, which I don't think has ever happened. The board also approved the boost program, not questioning the program, questioning the funding. 
It said it was funded by a grant. Is that a perpetual ongoing grant in perpetuity? Or when, when that grant ends, if it does, how will that program be funded? Or will it be discontinued? On this month's treasurer's report, I note that the taxes held in escrow, which all relates to the Shannon litigation, increased by nearly $800,000. That fund now totals $7.3 million. We've not heard anything in any recent meetings about the status of that litigation. Um, every time and every year money gets put in an escrow account, it leads to higher tax increase for the remaining taxpayers of the district. That is a very important fact that you need to keep in mind if and when that litigation gets resolved, those funds need to be returned to taxpayers. As I said, those funds by putting into escrow have resulted in the need for higher tax increases for resulting to all other taxpayers, so it should be returned. In July, um, I addressed the board about legal fees. And I'm gonna bring it up again tonight since I have not heard any steps being taken other than Dr. Zerby um, going out for some bids and proposals. This month's list of bills for September, $170,000 in payments to legal firms. Nine of the last 10 months, payments to legal firms have exceeded $100,000. The high water mark in that last 12 months, April and May, each month, payments to legal firms totaled nearly $300,000 each month. So for the 12 months then of September 2021, Payments to legal firms total $1.9 million. Um, at the, after the July meeting, after the courtesy of the floor session, the board president said, and I quote, we have taken steps to address the legal fees. We are looking at our right to know process and we're looking at ways that we can improve it so that we can reduce those legal fees. I don't wanna get into specifics right now at 20 after 11 at night, but it is something that has happened. I sent a follow up an email on July 28th after I spoke at the meeting. I got an initial response from the board president in three minutes. It was really vague, gave me no details. So I sent another email shortly after receiving hers on July 28th, and now nearly three months have gone by and nothing but crickets. So that tells me that this issue is not being addressed properly. If you can't tell us how you're gonna address legal fees, spending $1.9 million in a 12 month period is just, out of control, and that money can be better spent on educating our kids. Thank you. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? All right. Does anyone have any closing comments before I? Are you going to answer some of his yeah, questions? Yeah, I was going to respond okay. to some of the, the statements. So I, those were serious questions, so I didn't want to be lighthearted, but I did just want to let everyone know before Ms. Larsonese answers uh, those questions that the boys won after double overtime and PKs. So we have a playoff win. Um, obviously, there's many important things to discuss, but I did want to give a kudos to our student athletes. Shoot, that would have been a good happy end I know. to the whole thing, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm going to, I guess, work backwards. Um, I apologize for, for not following up again on that email, but I will say that the, the process that we are following to work on our legal fees, and it's specifically around right to know, um, it, some of which is, is an advisement that will, is on the agenda right now from Dr. Zerby. Um, we're going to be taking a, a sample right to know request, and we are going to be looking at it and seeing how different firms will evaluate it because right to know is not a science, it's an art. And, and finding out you know, what, what is the different ways that different firms respond to a right to know request to see if there's something that we can do to improve our process. We have um, made steps to make more information available rather than less information so that, I, I'm sorry that this doesn't meet your, your needs, Mr. Earnshaw, but this is, this is what we're doing. So if that's not enough, then I guess I won't continue. Um, Looking back, the cost of the textbooks for this year, um, obviously we're not buying brand new textbooks every single year. So um, yes, cost of textbooks may be a, a small amount this year, but that doesn't mean that that's all the money that is being spent on resources. Um, we also use a lot of online resources that are much less expensive. Um, and we often approve textbooks for a length of time. So we may approve a resource one year that is to be used for the next three, four, five years or, or something to that effect. So um, 
there was a lot that was said, so I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to be missing some of it. Um, the PAYS survey, um, the storage of the data for that is, is that's going to be handled by the third party, and I will make sure that um, we follow up on that and find out how it's being handled. But I would imagine that this is something that's being done across the state. Other, other districts are doing this as well. Um, as far as the right to opt out of the survey rather than opt in, we have discussed that with our solicitor and our solicitor has advised us that there is nothing wrong with the process that we are following here. Um, the privacy of the information is not a concern. There is not per, um, personally identifiable information recorded as part of the survey. Um, it is fully anonymous. Um, I think that's pretty much all I have for right now. Um, does anyone else have anything they would like to? Yes, Ms. Cancron. Uh, the benchmarking, just so you know, that, that we are reviewing that. I think if uh, Dr. Walsh, I think that is in November, we are going over the benchmarking. So that was presented in education as well. Um, and I will definitely look into information about the asynchronous days on that also. Thank you, that actually reminded me of another point that um, while the asynchronous days will not necessarily be of the same um, educational caliber as the synchronous days, um, some of these asynchronous days, for example, when you know a school happens to be struck by lightning and the alarm system fails, in the past that would have been a no school day. So the fact that we even have any sort of an option, I think, is, is a testament to one of the silver linings that has come out of this pandemic that we've found other ways to make sure that some learning can happen when our students can't be in our buildings. So our, is asynchronous instruction perfect? No, I, I think that we all agree that that's not how we would want our students to be learning every single day. But um, I think it's a good Band-Aid that we can use in times when we don't have any other choice. So I am glad that we do have it. Uh, Mr. Winters, I think you were about to say something, sorry. Yeah, two things, one uh, related to Shannondale. Uh, we have said before that we went uh, to court at the end of March and early April. I think it was March 30th or something like that. There was a third day, a three day trial. Um, it is in the judge's court, uh, no, no pun intended there, at this particular point in time. And I believe that probably is part of the reason that you'll see the April and May because of the preparation and the discontinued work on providing the written uh, response from our side uh, requires a lot of work. Um, so there was a, you will see excessive uh, or larger um, elements related to the Shenandoah case related to legal fees because it actually did go to court after 12, 13 years. Um, the point about elimination of three positions, I can understand the point that it could be considered to be overtaxing, but I believe at the time the positions were open because the scheduling had not been completed. We did not know the elementary school sizes. Uh, it's not an exact science when you're approving a budget in May or June. So it was not done with uh, malintent, uh, but the recommendation from the administration to eliminate those positions will save us money uh, moving forward. And the reason I supported the math one is because we do have a bubble class coming through graduating this year. So we'll have less students in the high school than we do uh, next year than we do this year. So the most likelihood we will not need that math position. Um, I think there was a question, Dr. Zerby, that the headline on a patch uh, article was, a, I think, a little misleading. Can you clarify what was sent in the communication to Mithacton related to the term warriors and the symbolism of Indians? Uh, you know, the, the letter speaks for itself in terms of uh, what what I had, had issued. Uh, the, the the conversation that, or, or the information that was provided to me after the uh, presentation on September 27th, uh, following uh, about a week after that, uh, was that there was a lot of concern uh, within uh, the school community with regards to uh, a su suggesting that we were changing the name uh, of warriors to some, something else other than warriors. Um, and the, the intent of that letter was to cl clearly articulate that the administration nor this uh, board of school directors has any intent 
of changing the name Warriors uh, at this time or any time in the near future. Okay, thank you. Uh, two other points. One other point on the Shenandoah. Um, so we, I know Mr. Earnshaw knows this, but as a responsibility, when a taxpayer files under under a uh, uh, under a protest, we are re required to accrue for that money a potential of some money being paid back to the taxpayer. And because it has gone for so long and they are the number one taxpayer, that is why you're seeing a, a very large number. But if the, the, the taxpayer is the one uh, initiating the, the, uh, the, uh, the protest, so that requirement is on the district to, to put that money aside. <clears throat> The other thing is, I, I really, I'm sure I'll get a wrath a of uh, stuff coming back to me next week. I really don't understand the quarantine process discussion and why it requires some type of response. The whole purpose is to keep our students in school as much as possible. And what this is doing is trying to give those students who are not, have not tested positive a way to stay in school longer. That is why we're doing it. COVID is not going away, but we want to keep our students in school. That was the whole purpose of the conversation. And for anybody to question that this is some type of political slant is so ridiculous in my opinion. This is about get, keeping those kids in school as much as possible that we've been beat up about for 18 months. This is exactly what we're trying to do. I really don't understand it. I need to stop before I say something I don't want to. Yeah, if I, let me just add something to that, uh, Mr. Winters, because you, you make an excellent point. This, isn't a, this is not a Mathactin program. I didn't make this up, and these people here didn't come up with the uh, test to stay program. It's coming from our county department of health. I'm just bringing it to you so that our parents and our community can, can take advantage of it if you so choose to. That's all this is. Uh, we didn't set the rules in terms of quarantining, in terms of vaccination, in terms of non unvaccinated. We don't set those rules. When I proposed uh, to the Board of School Directors uh, a, a few months ago with, with respects to what our, our safety plan should look like, it was with the intent of making sure, as Mr. Winters indicated just a few minutes ago, about keeping kids in school. Um, is it the best plan? I don't know. But based on everything that we are able to uh, manage with, with respects to the, the rules that we're governed by, it was, in my opinion, the best option for us. And we made that decision, this board made the decision, we move forward. We now have another opportunity to make better on that decision. And it's in just another option or another choice that, that people have. So. To, to politicize or make any kind of comments about what I'm bringing forward here with respects has, has nothing to do with anything other than the fact that we're providing another option. If no one wants to take advantage of it, there's nothing lost. If everyone wants to take advantage of it, we've helped some people out. And that's how I, that's how I look at it. And uh, this board you know, certainly can make those determinations uh, next week, but, uh, but Mr. Winters, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, the, you know, I, I, I know there's 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 issues with in a, in a larger political national you know context, but the fundamental I, I, I'm required to provide you solutions to the issues that are before us. I'm not here to say we should do this program because uh, you know this is the the, the political win or, or that. We're offering you solutions. And that's what we did, and that's and that's why I have it before you. If our nurses, if they didn't think it was good, they'd tell me that, and I would tell you that. This is going to be a, a good opportunity, and I'm sorry that you know you're we're having more than this discussion like this uh, versus having a discussion about hey, we got a great program, let's put it in place, and let's give an option to parents. End the story. The only thing I just wanted, I think a question we missed was about the boost program. And um, as, as far as I remember from education and here that it is a one, it's a, it's a one, one year program at the moment. 
So if I'm in, and well, Dr. Let, Walsh is well, shaping, shaping, I'll just clarify head. that. So the, the funding will come from the Essers three grant and that grant does take us through a, actually two school years, but the board only approved one year of the program pending on the outcomes of, from that program, we would make either make a recommendation to continue using the funds uh, that are available or, or, or not. And, and it, there is a likelihood that if it's successful in year one and successful in year two, you know, there would be a decision at some point to say, you know, we would have to close the program or we would, uh, you know, decide to figure out how to fund it in, in another way. The, the, the main part of this is, again, of, of addressing some of the learning loss associated with the previous uh, school years. And that was what the funding is designed to do. So we're actually using the money for the in, in, intent. Anyone else? Ms. Cancro. Sorry, this is the last thing. And I know that Dr. Malik, you brought this up and you bring it up at every, at when you talk about that the ranking and had plummeted. And it's hard for us not to speak before an election because just as you speak, you know, we're trying to be, we're on the defensive end and that's not what we're trying to be. We are trying to, we have to change the narrative about Methacton School District. You do, I do, we all do. Because to be honest with you, we you look at US World News and we are in the top percent nationally and within the state. If you're using a niche, which is subjective, that actually when you go on to it, says, please fill this out, you're able to really change the narrative. But what I am saying is that we are moving forward and you will see if you're involved in the strategic plan this week on Thursday, there's a presentation that Dr. Walsh will be providing, but we have to change the narrative. We are an excellent school district and we are all working together to go forward. And we have to do this as a community. As much as you're shaking your head, we have to just change the narrative. We do. Um, we need people to feel positive going forward. And I think we will definitely address, Mrs. Smith, your educational excellence. I've come to the education committee meeting we can have open conversation. We can provide it forward and present it in the work session as well. So we are open as a board and you give us this narrative now because you come to us and we're coming forward with you also. So that's all I have to say, but we are moving forward, so. Last call. All right, Mr. McGinnis. Motion to adjourn. All right, everyone have a good night.